Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, we're going Western style today, huh? You could see and wearing, I tip yeah, off so my... Yeah, so good morning. I, I tip my imaginary hat. I like how my dress works when I do that. Uh, good morning. Okay. From okay. our studios right if here in Coco Mimle. <laughs> <laughs> Across all digital platforms, this is the AM show on Joy News TV. We are your hosts, Sweetie Abochi and... Benjamin Akako. The man himself. Yeah. You know how we do it. Um... You wanted to say something before. Oh no, I just love Fridays. You know, I'm excited. You know, I love my do. African prints. It reminds me of the month of March and everything. I'm wearing flat shoes. It's okay. like easy. Oh, easy today. so today we're going to get jiggy with it, right? If you wish, but I'll serve you the news in a bit. And after that, NDC parliamentary candidates will get to North. Eric Edemagbana will be joining us for the news review. There's no sports today. Then after that, this man... I'm going to go blunt <laughs> with my yeah. blunt thoughts yeah. uh, today. I'll be sharing my thoughts on two crucial issues. I'll let you know about that in a bit. But um, right after that, major, major, major conversation we have. A conversation with the chairman of the National uh, Peace Council. It's a conversation on myriad matters. Um, for example, their role in ensuring Ghana maintains a peace. That the peace we've enjoyed before, during, and after elections in 2024 as well. Uh, what they are expecting from political actors and um, what sort of sanctions they expect to be meted out to people who foment violence or trouble. Uh, we'll be looking at all of that with our guest, Reverend Dr. Ernest Edujenfi, Chairman of the National Peace Council. I'm looking forward to that one. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway. Now, also on the show, we'd analyze a research by Global Info Analytics. It's shown that one, 65% of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. Two, 62% disapprove of President Okufado's performance. And 52% uh, of voters believe that government has performed very poorly. We've got a conversation on what the data really means for Ghana's election 2024. Our guest, Richard Ahiagba, who is a director for communications of the MPP. Sami Jemfi, National Commission Officer of the NDC. Musa Dankwa, Executive Director of Global Info Analytics. And Dr. Michael Ayamga, Development Economist at UDS. You don't want to miss that conversation with Benjamin Akaku. Well, I look forward to that one. Um, I, Sami Jemfi will not pardon you for the National Commission's officer. He'll be like, hey, my communication has turned into uh, commission. But I look forward to, I'm salivating. I'm just preparing for that one because looking at those people is going to be Bugat this morning and I'm ready for them. But Africa's model scout has been a long time coming, but now finally it's here. It's up for grabs for one rough diamond, giving the chance to be propelled onto the coolest catwalks and a... Uh, a la mod magazines. This is a journey of discovery for the continent's most promising future model. Filmed in Ghana, Accra, it's buzzing with high-profile publicity, offering the chance to make dreams come true, being the next Ajoa, Aboa, or Adesua Aigewi. We're telling you more about Model Scout and how you could become the next face of modeling, not just in Ghana, but maybe globally. Um, Naomi Campbell comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. You cry, Charlie. Have you ever I used explored? to be a model back in high school. I was in a beauty pageant. I am pageant. a prophet. <laughs> but this one, it goes into the past. I was past. in a beauty pageant, and right after, some people came and said, oh, I, I was slimmer than this. I was thin, actually. And so, yeah, I know how to strut and do all that. You know, uh, I'll show you guys later. But since it's Friday, we open the phone lines <laughs> so you can have your say. Maybe during that time, I'll show you what a good model I am. But um, welcome aboard the AM show. It's time now for the news. Let's get into it. Why are you in a hurry, girl? Welcome to the AM News. Let's get right into the details, starting with Chairman of Parliament's Health Committee, Dr. Nana Ayue Friye, is demanding an immediate intervention for the grant of waiver to enable authorities at the Comfort Nochi Teaching Hospital clear consignment of the, at, uh, the pots. The goods, made up of towels meant for the renovation of old blocks, are currently under demurrage as a result of delay in payment of their duties. Attempts by the facility to get government to approve a waiver have also not received the necessary attention. Nana, Dr. Nana Ayu Efriye says the waiver is long overdue and must be approved due to its critical nature. The waiver, waiver is supposed to be given by parliament. 
tax waivers by parliament, by finance committee. We have demonized, we've demonized waivers to look like giving waivers is so evil. Waivers is more of like telling government, telling government to go and pay for. But then government is supposed to go and do two million to pay itself. And government is saying that grant them waiver. If I take the taxpayers two million to go and pay to clear goods for Kofanoche, I'm taking it from the taxpayers' money. If I had 10 million, I've taken 2 million to pay for Confanoche. You understand? At the same time, let me give waiver so that I can still hold to my 10 million. The opposition has made and the society has made people to think like waiver giving is evil. Now, government institutions that must be able to get waiver, the posture of the finance committee in parliament is more of we are hostile to waivers. Now that the situation has been drawn to your attention, what do you intend to do? Because Kofanoche is honors, not only for the Ashanti region. Not, the honours is not on the finance minister. The honours is on parliament. Has it been drawn to your attention in parliament? Absolutely. This issue is there and we have to be able to grant them waivers. So how long has it been when there? When we come to parliament to do emergency sessions, we just have to grant them waiver. So they are raising against time? to demonize waivers. Waivers, we are positive and good, especially when it's going to save the taxpayer your own money that you are going to dole into something. If waivers is going to save you from your own money and just put that cost as neutralized, then what is wrong with that? So we need to stop and this so are you attitude. calling for an immediate I mean, granting of waiver for this project? It makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is common sense. I don't have to say it. We have to. Yes, we have to. The Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana is alarmed about a shortage of pharmacists in the five regions of the north. According to the society, the situation is stampeding the progress of healthcare delivery. President of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, Dr. Samuel Donko, raised these concerns when flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, met the society on his bold solutions for the future engagement. That in the past three years, the government has not employed pharmacists into the public sector. And that has not happened because of financial clearance issues. If you are producing pharmacists every year from the various universities, and yet the government is not employing the pharmacists. These are the same time we have, when you go to the various hospitals across the country, go to the northern zone of Ghana, the various, all the northern regions put together, the upper west, upper east, there is a manpower shortage or the shortage of pharmacists in various hospitals and clinics around. And that's why we raise the issue that this is an issue that can be tackled. We need a, need, we need a financial clearance for many more pharmacies to be employed into the public sector. Dr. Mahmoud Balmia says the demands by the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana align with his policy direction. He assures to transform the sector if elected president. Ghana has a comparative advantage in the whole of the sub-region in the pharmaceutical sector. We do. There is no doubt about it. Every um, Ghana has a, a comparative advantage. And therefore, we should be. If so if we want to be the pharmaceutical hub, which I want us to be, then we have to put our money where our mouth is to support local manufacturing. Without that support, we are not going to make it. The good thing about the pharmaceutical industry is that the demand for the products is there. 70% of our needs are imported. So the demand is there. So funding this is not something that you're going to fund and then you are losing money because there is a demand for the product. And so we are going to really, um, I'm very supportive, whether it's through Exim or another vehicle. I think if once we have made the decision, and it will come in my manifesto, by the way, that we are going to make Ghana a pharmaceutical hub, but you cannot, you cannot do it without funding. It's the same way that I want to establish a minerals development bank for the miners, because we can be you know, the, the major, you know, uh, mining hub in, in, in Ghana, especially for the small scale miners with some support. But we need a financial institution that understands the business of mining to support them with machinery and so on. But so for me, I believe that we, if, if once we have made the decision, which I've made, that we are going to make Ghana a hub, 
for manufacturing in this sub-region, then you have to support it with the financial resources. And I think the gain from that would be huge for Ghana. And I think we should do it because we have a comparative advantage. In other stories, recent data from the International Development Research Center based in Canada has revealed that women constitute 28% of researchers across all fields in Africa, with an even smaller percentage entering STEM-related fields. The report also highlighted a significant shortage of women advancing to leadership roles in STEM. The center has been highlighting the challenges women face in the bid to take up roles in STEM. There's more in this report. The research conducted has so far identified that some women in Kenya and Ghana have been able to enter STEM fields and progress to leadership levels. These women, according to the research, have done so because of factors such as personal interest, family background and support, as well as institutional factors such as networking. Speaking at the workshop, Senior Research Fellow for Environment and Sanitation Studies at the University of Ghana Dr. Adelina Mensa indicated that the goal of the project is to collect information to guide policy and interventions towards ensuring women's career development. Our project is named SISTERS, which is an acronym for what we are focusing on in terms of transforming um, institutions to advance women leaders, especially in STEM careers. So a lot of information is available or there's a lot of research that's been going on in terms of women's representation in these fields. But our specific focus is how do women actually progress in these fields to enter into leadership or managerial positions because you may have female representation within an institution but then they may rather, the numbers may be low but then the positions that they occupy will be at lower levels than higher levels. So that's the main idea behind this particular um, project. Head of Department for Geography and Resource Development, Professor Charlotte Asante highlighted some challenges that women face and encouraged them to take up roles in STEM education. So for instance, gender stereotypes and biases and the whole issue of balancing, the work-life balance, how to navigate between motherhood women's role as mothers, their roles as wives, and, and, and then balancing that with their profession is one key challenge that came up. Uh, another key challenge is um, the resources, the very limited resources, particularly in, uh, in, opportunity, in, uh, particularly in uh, academia. Uh, for sciences, you need resources, for instance, um, um, lab, laboratory, um, you need funds to do research because you also have to publish and without those resources it becomes very difficult. Coupled with their heavy teaching loads, it becomes very difficult for women in particular. The project's ultimate goal is to collect information to guide policy and interventions towards ensuring women's career advancement. Karen Obain's report read to you. Now a culture of silence has descended on the industrial area of the Asokwa municipality in the Ashanti region. Residents say air pollution from some industry industries in the area is making their lives a misery, but they have been warned that speaking up may cost them their jobs with government and companies. Love FM's Mona Lisa Frank Pong explores the situation. A solid waste scavenger sits at the Oti landfill site in Kumasi. He worries every day about his exposure to harmful substances from waste materials here. He's asked to keep his name secret for reasons that will soon become obvious. The man in his 30s is frail and sickly. He wears no protective clothing as he sorts out recyclables. <laughs> The man says he's battling headaches, coughs, difficulty breathing and tiredness. He attributes his poor health to the inhalation of hazardous substances from the solid waste. His last hospital visit revealed a respiratory infection, but he has no money to follow up. 
Medical practitioners have advised him to switch to a different job. But the man says, with no formal education, this is his only choice for a livelihood. Scavenging is a source of income for unskilled people in most developing countries. A study by the Journal of Environmental and Public Health in South Africa found health complaints and injuries are common, including respiratory infections, headache, diarrhea, and shortness of breath caused by polluting gases like methane and carbon dioxide. But the true extent of problems at the OT landfill is impossible to assess. In every step of our investigation has been blocked by management. The OT landfill facility is one of the largest disposal sites, receiving about 1,500 metric tons of garbage every day from Kumasi and its environs. Its location in the community has provided informal jobs for residents in the community from garbage collection, scrub dealing and scavenging. We tried to talk with other scavengers at the Uti landfill site, but management of the facility refused us entry. Informal workers inside the facility refused interviews, saying they feared being targeted by the company. But those who did agree to speak off camera revealed headaches and migraines are common. Kwame Lucky did agree to speak on camera. He has pitched camp close to the landfill site. After receiving garbage from the dump site, he airs it for three days to reduce the order before sorting out scraps. Management of the landfill knows about the problems. Two years ago, the site was redesigned to reduce environmental damage and eliminate hazards that the garbage was bringing to the community. But residents of neighboring communities of Dompase and Oti say the overwhelming smell from the site and their continued poor health shows more needs to be done. Former assembly member of the municipality, Elliot Bano Fusu Jr., agrees. How it rains, the air that comes from the landfill site into the community is very bad. We don't breathe good air at all, I must be frank. And it's having health effects on the residents. There's a community clinic here. I initiated it as an uh, as assembly member, that's Lady Julia. The residents always frequent there. The residents the resident have been going there with uh, related problems, uh, health related problems associated with the, what do you call it? Briefing of poor uh, briefing or pollution of the air. I'm a few meters away from the Oti landfill site, and uh, residents here have complained that the air quality of this area is not so good. This area is part of the Asqua municipality, which is the industrial hub of the Kumasi metropolis and even the Ashanti region in totality. Researchers from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have conducted series of research which proves that this place remains one of the most heavily polluted places in the Ashanti region. Healthcare facilities in the area, the Lady Julia Health Center, Kumasi South Hospital and other health facilities refused to comment on the incidence of air pollution related illnesses in the municipality. Off the record, staff told LabFM they were afraid of being politically targeted for talking to a journalist. But former assembly member Bano claims that healthcare facilities in the area record high cases of respiratory infections. Sometimes too. The air is also polluted as a result of uh, what we call it, smoke from the landfill site. It is recently that it has come down some more. Formerly, when uh, they, they just uh, alight, they, they, they put fire into the sawdust that they have been bringing to the landfill site. So the, the atmosphere becomes dark, then we, we, we breathe in uh, what we call it, smoke. So it also has effects on us. Talk about complaint. We have been complaining 
for the past 10 years. It's not just the waste dump that is causing air pollution and sickness here. On a typical day in the Asukwa municipality, a haze hangs in the air. The municipality is the industrial hub of the Ashanti region with oil, wood and food processing companies situated alongside the Kumase Abatoa Company Limited. Before 2020, meat was often roasted over car tires and wood. Butchers burned furs in open fires producing thick black smoke. Butchers reported high rates of respiratory infections. In 2019, then Sanitation Minister Cecilia Abinadapa banned the practice to stop the harmful effect on the health of consumers and residents. Butchers have switched to the use of liquefied petroleum gas to singe the furs. The time that we were using the, the tires, even that time, the smoke was entering us more. Even sometimes the briefing, or even when you cough, you see this level different from now that we are doing the gas. While government will not release details of air pollution in the area, a group of scientists and other experts measured the air in October 2023 as part of the Clean Air Summer School held in collaboration between the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. Air sensors mounted at the Oti landfill site in the Kumasi Abattoir measured air quality over several days. At the landfill site, the air pollution exceeded the World Health Organization's guidelines for what's known as PM2.5, the most dangerous air particles all day, every day. It also exceeded Ghana's less stringent guidelines for several hours a day. At the abattoir, the census found the air was unhealthy for a third of the day. These high levels of air pollution are harming the health of residents according to medical coordinator for doctors in business organizations and public health consultant, Dr. Florence Buampunsim. It has to be a consistent exposure to it. So if you have been in a particular area and you've been there and it's constant inhaling of these um, gases that are emitted, that's when you can have these effects that I'm about, some of these effects that I'm about to talk about. Um, so there's respiratory issues where you have upper respiratory issues, breathing problems, coughing, you have irrita irritation and things like that. We also have cardiovascular problems, okay, um, which causes problems for your heart, in long term, but all these things I'm talking about is long term exposure to these gases. The research team presented these findings to management of both the landfill site and the Kumase Abattoir Company Limited in October. A month later, the production manager of the Kumase Abattoir, Michael Tongban, denied the research team recorded high levels of air pollution at his facility. Some people uh, came from KNUST, came and did. Uh, conduct research on air pollution. It wasn't bad as we are talking about. Understand? And you know this place is part of industrial area. We are not isolated. There are industries all over here. You understand? So air pollution is minimal here. Management of the Kumasi Abattoir Company Limited refused to speak on the findings. But days ago, a scientist of the research team revealed the Kumasi Abattoir Company Limited reached out to them privately for a collaboration on how best they can control or prevent air pollution in the facility. In an interview, Municipal Health Director Faustina Osei Mensah conceded that respiratory infections are second on the list of health issues recorded in the area, but Director Mensa played down the threat from industry. Instead, she blamed cars. With acute respiratory diseases, we encourage them, if you had infection, just put on your nose mask and we encourage them to report to the health facilities as soon as they see the signs and symptoms. There are a lot of activities that are going on. And this area being an industrial area, we have a lot of cars that are moving in, out. The whole place is 
choked. Human traffic is also going on and vehicular traffic is also going on. So a lot of activities are going on, especially with cars. People are using cars and the, the uh, fumes from their engines are spreading all over. That they are all giving us infection. And if you look at the factories, we have factories and the activities that are going on in the factory, we visit them, advise them concerning their burning of their waste. But now, the municipality has been found to have high levels of air pollution. Director Mensa said the government is embarking on sensitization programs to combat human activities which contribute to air pollution. In the meantime, Dr. Florence Buampunsim advises workers and residents in light industrial areas like the Asokwa municipality to protect themselves. And most of the time, those who are even working directly with the, um, these machines are in protective garments. But I'm even going as far as people who live by these machines because sometimes you feel like you live by it, so you don't necessarily have to, you don't live it, but you are inhaling it, you get it. So I would advise people who actually live by big industrial um, areas, big industrial machines, to make sure they wear their nose masks consistently. This story was a collaboration with New Narratives with funding from the Clean Air Fund. The funder had no say in the story's contents. For Joy News, Mona Lisa Frimpon reporting. Now for our final story for this bulletin. The Perfect Peace Foundation Ghana housing over 500 orphans and neglected children in Amakum in the Ashanti region is recounting financial challenges in managing the charity home. Authorities say the situation has affected the operation of the facility. The situation is being mitigated with a donation from the Ebubrokosia Fan Club, providing a month's worth of food supplies for the orphaned and vulnerable children. Here's the report. Situated in a small neighborhood at Amekum in the Kumasi metropolis, the Perfect Peace Foundation since 1991 has been offering support and fostering children with parents and from strong, vulnerable backgrounds. These children are being supported in basic, junior and senior high school and university education in Ghana. But the running of the foundation's charitable activities is hard hit by the country's economic challenges. The administrator of Peace Perfect Foundation, Kofi Mensa, says the increasing number of inmates is overstretching the facility's budget and finances. We also need financial support because as we speak now, uh, if some of them fall sick, we are, we are to send them to the hospital and all these things, we need financial support. Sometimes um, uh, they, are, they have issues, health issues that we are also looking after. The Bubrokosia Fan Club commemorated its one-year anniversary by donating bags of rice, boxes of tomato paste, cooking oil, and other items to the orphanage. The intervention is to help mitigate the struggles of the orphanage. Rosina, a champion, who spoke on behalf of the club, says the gesture forms part of the club's designated mandate. <laughs> Speaking in appreciation of the gesture, Kofi Mensa indicated that the food supplied will keep the beneficiaries fed for over four weeks. We are very happy to have uh, Abu Brokosia as a foundation uh, to come and donate uh, these items to the orphans and needy in these premises. Um, these items could take us about a month. The Abu Brokosia Foundation is a social support system for young men and women to provide financial and social support for each other. Founder of the club, Nana Ama Kwatima, is admonishing public support for social organizations to heighten their impact on society. 
and you may win a yen or a boffo be, and a soya sunny, and yes, you are more the boca crack, a cahon, and see a say a beer part to so be beer up as a boy piano, who waits in my barber boy, a brocosia, nay, ye drew, ye bought a brocosia, ye pray, ye be, ye be say, ye pay members, our mojo, our moody or mooney, some barber kind of home, till you are ready be as a person over joining be a rich mother. Reporting for Joy News, my name is Clinton Yamua. That brings us to the end of the AM News. Up next is uh, the News Review. Our guest is already in the studio, so let's get into it. Stay with us. This is the news review segment right here on the AM show, and we are back on your screams. Benja Did I say screams? Screams. Benjamin and I are in the studio, and we are sandwiching um, the NDC parliamentary candidates for K2 North. Eric Edemagbana is our guest for the news review. Welcome, gentlemen. I'm welcoming hey. you because I'm, on, I I'm on the far right. Should I scream? <laughs> because I said. <laughs> <laughs> today, Eric came in the very early, so Benjamin has nothing to say. He has uh, nothing on NMT. Today, I didn't, I didn't come to work. <laughs> I just came to, I came to play. Right. But right before we get in and usher in the conversation, you do know that this segment is always brought to you courtesy of Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. Now, here's what they're offering you. As always, if you're a man, prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening uh, for free. Do you know your fertility status? Do you know what's happening with your prostate? I see the way Adam is looking at me. I'll be coming to him uh, shortly. But reach out to Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic at any of their branches. Here in Accra, they're at Spintex opposite the Shell signboard. Kumase, Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anaji State, Tema, Community 22. Techiman Hanswa and Asiyam Anzama. Their call lines are 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. The, the end, end to chronic, to chronic disease. disease. And just the start of the news review as we as we grilled tilapia this morning. And who's going to be grilled? <laughs> Eric Adam Agbana. Thank Good you. to have you. Good to have you. Nice if you've given me a... Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And by the way, both of you are looking very Ghanaian this morning. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We yes. try to... Rip we are repping the flag. Yeah. Yes. We are repping the flag. Yes, yes. You know how we do it. Yeah. Benjamin is going to ask you some... Uh, going to give you oh, oh will I? Yeah, you will. Give okay. you a minute or okay. two to tell us something, Ben. Okay, so I like what you do it. We, we usually do this. Uh, she's just throwing it back to me. But we allow our guests on the news review to share their thoughts on any pertinent matters uh, in the country. No politics. Stick to the issues and let's talk Ghana. Well, let me let me say good morning to our cherished viewers across the world and to sincerely appreciate the good people of Ketunov for the support and, and warm reception uh, throughout the Easter um, holidays. Oh. I attended over 20 programs, and one of the things that I find quite interesting and um, commendable is the fact that almost all the communities we visited, they are initiating some mm. self-help projects and only asking the politicians and other stakeholders to donate to support them. It tells us that communities are no more waiting for government to lead the process for development. Communities are taking initiatives. In some communities, young people were contributing to drill boreholes and all of that. And I think that these things are commendable. And I found um, them uh, good examples for other constituencies or other communities to emulate. But going into my two minutes, there's um, an issue that is of um, concern to me. It has to do with the investigations about the National Scholarship Secretariat. You read my mind. And because if you hadn't gone there, I would have gone there. With and you. for me, I am surprised that that issue 
is not inciting the kind of national conversation that I thought it should. Are you sure? Yes. And, and Have you followed see, this network? Uh, well, I'm following, I'm following your network. But when I say national conversation, uh, you know how some particular issues trend across board on all networks. Mm. It, is not, it is not same. Your network is doing very well. Maybe because the fourth estate, the likes of Manasseh and Co., have worked with multimedia and all of that. But aside multimedia, many of the other media networks are not giving it the attention that it deserves. And it breaks my heart. Benjamin, there is a growing perception among young people that the political class are only interested in working for themselves and their families. It is a disturbing trend such that I fear that someday, if we don't take some pragmatic steps to address these issues, young people of this country may rise up against the political class. But when I say the political class, we are all included. It is not just a matter of NPP, NDC, CPP, all of us who find ourselves in politics. Because already, young people are thinking that politicians are not working in their interests. And then you wake up to, we are doing so much. Some of us are trying our best mm. to change this narrative, to get people to believe that our democracy may not have worked for us or deliver the progress that it should, but it is still the best way forward. Mm. I have always said that democracy may not be delivering the outcomes that we expect, but I will always choose the ballot over bullet. Mm. And yet, you wake up to the news that scholarships meant for brilliant and needy Ghanaians it's also been shared like cake among the people who are high-ranking officials in government. Let me just interject briefly. Um, I'll let you go on. But yes. you do realize this isn't the first time, though within this, this period, we've heard a lot, especially from 2017, 2018, 2019 till now. Yes. But it is not only within this administration that we've heard of stuff like that. I, I agree with you. And so my condemnation is across board. And I wonder how some politicians are able to sleep at night, knowing that you are depriving the people the very basic necessities of life. And in addition, scholarships that are meant for the needy, you grab it, some are grabbing it in doubles, some grab it, they are not even attending the schools, and they are even charging the needy students at discounted rates monies to be paid before these scholarships are offered to them. I think this issue is a serious threat to national security and all those involved, the names that have been mentioned, if they have conscience, they must refund the monies paid to them or paid for them by the National, Secret uh, national uh, Scholarship Secretariat. Benjamin, we have come to a point where we ought not to condone some of these things and accept them as normal. Right. Imagine the daughter of Freddie Blay, board chairman of GNPC, a man who claimed that he used his own resources to buy buses for all the 275 constituencies mm. for his party. The daughter of such a man benefiting from scholarships. Now, when that happens, those of us from very humble homes, those of us from homes where our parents had no political office or had no connection to anyone in high authority, what is our fate? Benjamin, okay, so the two minutes is stretching issue, beyond. Yeah. But, but I just, I just, want, I I, I, I just wanted to this ask this as, in yes, the end. Yes. I, what you're saying resonates with me. I've always shared that me, my grandfather was a big cocoa farmer in the OT region at a point at Bishop Herman. I've been, and that's a long time ago. I benefited from Cocoa Scholarships, Cocoa Board. Yes. And back then it was streamlined. You got it because it was because of my grandfather yes. that I got it. Um, when I went to Cuba, 
it was based on merit, the University of Ghana, read Spanish. There was no, there was nothing anywhere. It was clear, top students, a few of them would be selected, benefit. Yes, those who I didn't want it or those who may have got it but had the means, actually, interestingly, yes. would go to Spain. Exactly. You, you get it, yeah, footing their right. own yes. bill. It happened with the French students as well. Yes, some would go, some to, would France, go to France, others would go to others, Benin yes. and all of that. In this instance, what do we do? The head himself has said, of the scholarship secretariat, has said, maybe we need an act of parliament, a scholarship act to regulate. I spoke to... Um, Professor Day and, and some others who say that's not necessarily the solution. I'm just asking, your administration could come to power in the coming years. Yeah. What would you do differently? Because we've had this time and again from politicians, you come and you do the same. Benjamin, I think that we need to... Just briefly on that and yes. then Sweetie will Benjamin, get into We need papers. to start from somewhere. I believe that, one, now that this investigation is out and the names have been mentioned, we have to impress on the authorities to ensure that the people mentioned those who benefited from scholarships that they did not deserve must be made to refund. Then it becomes a starting point for the conversation. Refund. Well, yeah, but, refund. but what, what? Somebody what, like, no, somebody like, somebody Someone like, will tell you they are Ghanaians. Like, yes, they are Ghanaians. They are Ghanaians. But you see, let me tell you, there are two, basically, there are two fundamental ways by which people can access scholarships. Mm. The first one is based on merit. Mm -hmm. So like Benjamin said, you may come from a very wealthy home. But there are some scholarships that demand that you make maybe a pass mark or based on your performance. Mm. You, you earn it based on merit. Those scholarships are there. You can't convince me that with the courses that these people went to offer and how they assessed or they got some the scholarship, didn't even attend they got it, they got it, they got it, they, 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 they got it, they got it, they got it. I think 17,000 plus pounds have been paid. None of the names mentioned got the scholarship on merit and that has been established. Number two, no, but, but, but hold it, hold, as it hold based it. on need. Hold it. None of these people are needy. Uh, I, I, I think, I think if you're looking at the academic prowess of some of them, you could say they could, no. in, some, in some way, get scholarships of different no. kinds. Yes, yes get different kinds. They, they could the, merit. The I'm just secretary. saying that on merit. But not the they scholarship may, secretariat. But not from here. Not, not from here. That, that's right. exactly the point. Not from right. scholarship secretariat. Yeah. Maybe a university offering you admission hmm. based on your performance or how strong your application may be, mm. could have offered any of them a scholarship. And that is none of our business. But we are talking about scholarship from the scholarship secretariat, a government institution. And you can't convince me that any of these people got a scholarship based on merit. All right, thank you. I Th thank that you that for that point. Refund. And look, people like Gifty Owari, I know Gifty personally. Can, can, we, can we leave He's names of out of... No, listen, I want listen, listen. You see, Adam, of, Adam, I mean, Adam. I'm not mentioning, I'm making issue, a point. I'm um, speaking, I'm speaking a, to a very a, passionate. If Gifty is listening yeah, to me, so, if, mm -hmm. if people like Gifty, I know Gifty person, and I'm making a national appeal to her that, look, we the young ones in politics, we must begin to do things differently. The fact that it happened in the past does not justify that it must happen now. If you have conscience, Gifty, go and refund the money. Look, what we are doing we are destroying the moral fiber of our society. Some things may not be illegal, but they are unethical. Mm. It is simply not right. It is cruel. It is wicked. Look, as I sit here today, I have friends from the University of Ghana who did extremely well. Some got first class, got admission. Some of them, all they needed was money to pay for their flight in order to go to the universities outside and assess their scholarship. They did not get that. Wow. And yet, they will go to scholarship secretariat, they will tell them, and let me tell you, two years ago, the same 2021, 2022, the, the same season when these investigations took place, I have a friend called Derek Abuchi. Derek did extremely well, applied for scholarship, at the scholarship secretariat, <coughs> he was denied. And these are people who are just Ghanaians, who are working hard, want to empower themselves. And you deny them. This is wickedness. Then you share it like toffee. You share it like 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 ice cream among the political class. Okay. And I don't, want right. to I don't think it. that a day will come that, no. when these no. politicians will actually refund this. Perhaps we can. You say it's a when moral issue. When we start a campaign, when we start a campaign, they make. How we is Freddie Blay not ashamed? Is the the CEO of the one one is, or something Bisa Health app or something? Look, I I think that. Anyone who has benefited from this scholarship mm. unmeritedly, they must be made 
to refund the money. By Let's right. start point, from here. Point, point it, is, it is a shame. Point it is made. wickedness. And I just don't get it. We, we, can, we can start over again. Clean slate. And uh, hopefully, yeah. you see, it's always easy for some of these things to be said. But I, I say that when you're in there and, and you are able to do the right things. You know, doing the right thing is not... Is not standing. Can I can I give you my personal standing. experience? No, no, no. I'm not no, let me, referring let me give, to you personally. Yes, I, I want us to move well, from me, there. Let me give you. But a, I'm just saying that politicians, right? In 2014, you must set the right example. That's 20, it. 20, bottom line. In 2014, I was doing my service in Parliament. Mm -hmm. I was working with the Honourable Samuel Okujeto Black at the time. He was Deputy Minister for Education, mm -hmm. and so Get Fund is an institution that is under the ministry. Mm -hmm. When I informed him that I had gotten admission to Dundee University in the UK mm. and I needed scholarship. He asked me to apply for the scholarship from the institution because he just could not influence the decision of Get Fund to give me scholarship because I was working with him and I respected his decision. Did you get the scholarship? I did not and I didn't even apply because my boss at the time took a principal decision. Look. Is that we why he start... didn't apply? Because he, he told you he couldn't influence it for you? Be because, because I have previous experience where I have put in applications for scholarships, get fund, scholarship secretary, and I didn't get it. You see how that work, that plays into exactly Be what no, we So now. I didn't get he it. Thought so he thought he could see, influence it so, for you because no, he was your no, boss at the time. So you, he was no, in a position of power. I didn't, and no, these listen, people listen, are also listen, in positions see, of see, power. I said, mm. I informed him okay. that I have gotten admission. But what, what, what was he said? What, no, no, okay, so you I told him and you were just no. telling him you had got admission. Exactly. So when mm -hmm. you check, I didn't. I, I couldn't access that scholarship just, just because of where I was working. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I was not working there, based on merit, of course, yes, and not to praise myself, but I believe I could merit a scholarship from there. But the point must be made that there are lots of Ghanaians who put in applications for scholarships on a daily basis who are deserving. All right. For some of them, their parents Adam. are not even alive. Adam. For some of them, where the next meal is coming from is a challenge. If they okay. can't assess we, it, we, we, if, how we, are the political... We, we, we literally have about 10 minutes, minutes yeah, to, to get into the papers. So no, me, I, don't I see your passion. We're going to have to do this very quickly. Okay. Let's well, start with the um, daily... It, it's amazing daily how two graphic. minutes has turned into about 20. Yeah. Right? But it's been a good conversation. Let's start with a daily graphic newspaper. So graphic... Consolidating media leadership, graphic to raise funds on GSE. So the government has approved a plan to recapitalize the graphic communications group, the injection of fresh capital to enable the wholly state-owned company to run as an independent limited liability company to make critical investments necessary to maximize its potential in the digital media uh, landscape. Currently, the country's biggest media establishment, which has chronicled its history and served the population for more than seven decades with incredible news, um, generates only enough to meet its operating expenses and needs additional capital leverage for more strategic investment. Didn't they um, list the stocks for this on the markets last year, sometime, so, so, as so, an attempt so to it's not, it's not, it's more not, capital into The it. fundamental issue here sweetie, is, is mismanagement mm -hmm. at graphics. And we need to speak to the issues as they are. A couple mm -hmm. of years ago, the Graphic Communications Group Limited mm. was one of the most vibrant, one of the most financially viable media institutions in this country. What happened? That is the question we need to ask. Every single day, when I get my daily graphic, I see lots of ad adverts in the graphic. There is no private newspaper that gets as much media adverts or commercials than the daily graphic. No mm. private media house. So I want to ask what happened to graphic. Where you does see, the money go? Huh? People are getting comfortable with mismanaging state facilities, state institutions and agencies. And because nobody gets punished, at the end of the day, government will come in like they want to do, re-inject some more capital and all of that. Everybody is just com comfortable mismanaging the assets of the state. I think right. that we must begin as a country to give out some punitive measures to people who mismanage state assets mm -hmm. and institutions. So the basic question again is, what happened? As we open the graphic, 
almost every page of the Daily Graphic today contains an advert. Why? Are they not raising enough revenue that today well, they can't even pay their workers? And they today. have to come back to... You know, you see, Benjamin, if you want the to things that are becoming a norm in this country, mm. it's, it's, these things have become, have become a norm. And they do it, they mismanage it. Government will come in. Nobody is punished. Nobody is sanctioned. Nobody is made to resign. And so people will continue to do some of this. Thing. Right. The let's let's of get into some other stories. Yeah, there's a change. story. There's right. another story here. Uh, no, sorry. Let me do this story about NATO Max 70. No, not this one. Even, even my bank is advertising. Get fund projects must be completed on schedule. So the story is on page seven of the Daily Graphic. The Ghana Education Trust Fund, a public trust fund set up by an act of parliament, to provide funding to supplement the government's efforts to provide education infrastructure from pre-tertiary to tertiary level, has over the years largely lived up to its mandate. Since its inception, GetFund has funded the delivery of quality education in the country <laughs> from the basic to tertiary level through the fund's accru accruals from 2.5% VAT imposed on selected goods and services specifically to fix the funding gap in education. Now, though gets fund, public institutions at all levels have benefited from the provision of academic infrastructure, supply of books, the provision of essential resources for all levels of education, blah, blah, blah. Um, the establishment of Gets Fund meets, met some resistance from a section of the public and institutions. Today, there is no question about the usefulness of the fund. Um, I'm not sure what the story is, but I don't want to go on and on and on about it. I think Gets Fund is saying that there are some projects that must be completed. During the launch of the Ghana Smart Schools, I was speaking with the administrator, and he said that they released some monies to complete all infrastructure works that are ongoing. We know that uh, NAT so, so, or NAGRAT is, was it NAGRAT? Ghana Student Union something yeah. they are so, they are threatening to go on so, strike so, because Sweetie. they don't want to cap and cap gets fund and all these issues coming up Sweetie, mm. the issue is that for the past six years get fund has been capped i i knew you would talk about get fund the has capping more gauged to take loans and all of that and so whatever money comes into the account it's not used for ah, get fund projects. what they mean here. Okay. Now, across... No, 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 but, but let's, let's clarify. It's not that whatever money comes to the get fund is not used. Look, Part of it is shaved off yeah. by the capping. But if you say, technically, if you say yeah, all the money that comes to, into the get to, fund is not used by get I'll, fund... I'll explain, I'll explain what, that, what, then, what I mean. Then that's something else. Benjamin, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. As we speak, get fund is owing lots of contractors. Mm. And there are some projects that are as old as 10 years, 8 years, 7 years. Now, when you even pay the amount you are owing the contractors, the same amount, they are unable to complete the project because prices of goods and services have increased. Mm. At the time they did their estimates and projections, in 2017, 2018, mm. cement was being sold at about 38 cities 40 cities and all, depending on the type or brand. Today, cement is about 100 Ghana cities a bag. So when you are owing a contractor 10 million from 2017 or 2016, and you are paying the contractor the same 10 million, you don't expect him to be able to complete the projects. So this whole business of we have released funds to contractors and all, engage the contractors. Well, they we have paid for what, 450,000 tablets. Uh, to be distributed to you see, the because, because get fund has become a political tool at a time you are owing contractors then almost every single campus there are projects of get fund that are uncompleted projects have come to a halt you can't complete the projects but you use that as a conduit to provide or pay for four hundred and fifty thousand uh, laptops or tablets to yeah. be shared to schools and all of that it's like you go to a house or a family where they cannot even fend for themselves. They are struggling to get three square meals and all of that. Then the next minute you hear that family is out there doing charity that we are donating, just like ECG. That has become the business of this government. I want to do the, the headlines ECG in the daily owing, statement. ECG was, ECG was owing a lot of people within the value chain of public.
power production. Adam, but they went Adam, we have just about the seven minutes service. to go. Right, so point let me, let's, let me let's, let's look this. at, and, and here's yes, what we're going I'm to going do. I'm going to the Daily Statesman. Just Quick headlines, and yeah, then you are also just touch and go on so the headlines. So Ghana yes, best governed in West Africa. Interesting. Stories on page two. World Economics Governance Index puts nation fifth in Africa. Minister Hill's professionalism of GIS officers. NHI boss outlines four points vision to revolutionize healthcare. And CG, the Femme Course Injunction application, was ripe for hearing. NDP advocates inclusive governance policy. Those are just headlines on the daily. Ghana States best governed in West Africa. We don't have time to do, do, do this. Not, sorry. Well, yeah, there, there's, there's, that, there's that UK entity. Yes, but, I, but, I have my own thoughts on that, yeah. but. Can we I are fifth in Africa. Thirty <laughs> seconds. Thirty seconds. Right. So your speed, world economics. Your speed is determined by what is chasing you. That is no. It. What I'm chasing. No, what's chasing no, me. Your speed. World is determined economic. By what is chasing fine. you. Fine. Eric. Let me do the story, no, no, Eric. We, we have, I've, so I've read the story. So re, do your reaction. I've read the story. My point is that if you are a lion mm -hmm. and you find yourself competing with snails and all of that. You may obviously become first, but mm -hmm. ask yourself, is that where you belong in terms of competition? All right. So your point so is made, but for the, for, the of, for the sake of for the sake of our no, viewers, no. just Every briefly look at that story. Every organization Adam, in the please, United Kingdom briefly. has ranked Ghana <laughs> as the fifth best governed country on the African continent and the best governed country in the whole of West Africa. The good governance ranking, according to World Economics, was assessed through four main indexes. They are corruption perception rule of law, press freedom, and political rights. So th these are the criteria but that Ghana in West Africa, was as if you are in West Africa, you are competing with countries, you are competing with countries like uh, <laughs> where Niger, Nigeria. Is it Ni Ghana? Niger, Niger, technically, but uh, uh, Burkina I Faso, mean, but I know what you're trying to say. I mean, the point is that but, but for that me, should be our target. For me, and, really, uh, like that saying, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is, yes. is king. Because you look at some of the metrics they are using, good governance, democratic Perception. practice, corruption perception. Yes. And I'll tell you that. It's only uh, that even though but it's, but it's just that it's, the situation is so bad yes. that even in our ignominy, we can still rank high. Uh, because of, I mean, I saw that, and of course, but it's a survey they have conducted there. Anyway, uh, whatever. And, Adam, uh, let's get into your papers that. quickly. Just, Adam, we don't have the time, so just uh, your headlines. You can pick one story and look at it. Well, Mahama Hills free SHS. Mm. That's a that's a story. Do you want me to read the story? You can read. Your it starts from. It actually starts from right there on the right here. Okay. After years of opposing the free senior high school policy, former President John Dramani Mahama has finally admitted that our Kufaro government flagship education program has been successfully implemented. Mm. Uh, well, I, I have listened to President John Dramani Mahama mm. speak on free SHS, and he has been very consistent. His position is this. Fix the fundamentals mm. and roll out a free senior high school policy in a manner that you are not compromising quality. Mm. And he has been very consistent on that. We have said that the NDC has never been against free SHS. Our approach was that introduce it in an incremental basis where you start with the day students, and that was started in the 2015-2016 academic year. Make sure that you provide the classrooms that are needed so that when free SHS leads to increased enrollment, people will be able to have access to classrooms. Now, when they abandoned all of these fundamentals and decided to implement it, that is why they had to introduce the double track. That is why today you go to many of our senior high schools, they have compromised on quality. And look, <clears throat> they are trying to use the performance of the students in the WASI mm. to justify that free okay. SHS has been successful. We have to go, right. But when you go to the schools, they will tell you, many of the teachers will even tell you, all that this government has been able to do and what that they have invested in right. is that even in terms of supervision during mm. the exams, mm. they are buying, instead of buying textbooks for the kids, they are buying past questions. They are investing heavily in all of those things. And there, there's nothing wrong with using quality. past questions. No, you but, see, I... but you don't, you don't, you don't invest in that at the expense of the textbooks. Adam, so, thank you, thank you, provide a thank you. Point made. Let's, everybody can let's wrap with the Ghanaian Times newspaper. I'll just uh, look at these two stories. FDA destroys 500 bills of substandard baby diapers. 
uh, valued at 3 million Ghana CDs at a recycle plant in Ashaiman uh, near Tema. Kudos to the FDA for that. But the main story I'll look at, and uh, I'll be gone in 20 seconds, don't overrun budgets for projects. Finance Minister appeals to MDAs. So the Minister of Finance designate uh, Dr. Mohammed Amin Adam has appealed to chief directors and heads of all ministries, departments and agencies to ensure strict compliance with their stated budgets for the year in order to curtail overruns. That's it um, for me. And mind you, today, as we wrap, um, we'll not be doing sports. So right after this, I'll be bringing you my blunt thoughts. And yes, the scholarship bit is one of the things I'm going to be uh, talking about. I'm also going to be talking about the tablet saga, and I've titled my blunt thoughts, The Paucity of Truth Held to Strict Proof. Ghana's hemorrhage continues. The paucity of truth held to strict proof. Ghana's hemorrhage continues. You have uh, 15 have seconds to give your final thoughts. Well, let me say thank you to you for uh, having me um, and to wish uh, all our viewers a very good weekend. Uh, I will be in Winneba tomorrow for a lecture on the 24-hour economy to the students, right. being organized by the Central Regional Youth Wing, together with the team over there. And on Sunday, I'll be somewhere in uh, Kumasi, doing some preaching in a church. I'm sure City will be surprised, but uh, I'm a pastor too, if, if you don't know. God help I'm us all. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> we end the review, end point homeopathic clinic, helping us uh, to bring you the news review, as always. They're offering you prostate, um, Screening for free if you're a man. Fertility screening for free if you're a woman. Just reach out to them at any of their branches here in Accra. It's Pintex, opposite the Shell signboard. Kumase Kronuma here behind the Angel Educational Complex. Takra De Anaji State, Tema Community 22. Techi Manhanswa and the Siaman Zama. Their call lines 0244-867068 or 0274-234-321. And Point Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. I'm about to drop bombs. Um, not literally but figuratively on Blunt Thoughts. Stay for that. Did Welcome back on the AM show. And today, well, as every Friday, I'm sharing with you my blunt uh, thoughts. Today, I've titled it The Paucity of Truth Held to Strict Proof. Ghana's hemorrhage continues. We're bleeding. The paucity of truth held to strict proof. Ghana's hemorrhage continues. If you asked me, I would tell you that probably the most crucial most fundamental mistake, gravest problem we have in this country, which percolates into the rest of our lives, is the lack of truth. And because of that lack of truth, from top to bottom, nothing is working in this country. Nothing. Not with the technocrat, not with the politician, not with the preacher man or the preacher woman, not in sports, or sports administration, even in media. Yes, some will not speak the truth. And because of that, we are where we are. Because of a lack of truth. You may not like what I'm telling you today. I've seen preachers on the pulpit saying what they themselves know is false. I've seen people who in the past were very critical today say nothing as though they had gone mum. Speak the truth, and the truth will set you free. Sometimes people see me out there and they wonder, how are you able to do this without fear? Because I have a clear conscience. But you, because of what you are doing, you are afraid. And that's why you want to hide in the dark. So today, two crucial issues I'm going to look at as I come here. Government scholarships 
and this whole tablet saga. I hope to be done in about 10, 11 minutes. And we start from here. You see, when you go to the, the website of the scholarship secretariat, that's, that's an interesting bit. Because if you look at their mission, their, what they hope to do, what they stand for, it, they'll tell you quickly. To utilize government funds, get fund and donor support for the provision of scholarships to brilliant Omar Jane Daho Fala, but needy Sikano Ebi Niho students and qualified workers at a minimum access cost. Qualified workers at a minimum access cost for human resource development for the purpose of national growth and development. Next slide. Now, if we go to the very next slide, and even before I get here, you would ask yourself, some of those who have got these scholarships, do they qualify? Yes, they may be Ghanaian. Yes, they may be this and that. Maybe they may be brilliant. No one is saying they are not. But you see, someone sent me a message yesterday. Attended the TTU, wanted to upgrade. Internally, you and yes, what to Kwanko Bibiao. Internally, the Nukufio was not there. This person was denied. The fourth estate speaks about that girl from a rural area. Brilliant. Did her best. Scored excellent grades at university. Wanted to make something of herself. It's not to say traveling outside is the only way, but she had got admission. She went impressed you know, the panel and everything. Everyone knew she was going to get it. In fact, that was the, the, the messaging right from there. Yet she comes out and after a while, no word. So she goes back. Yo, what is happening? And someone whispers to her, listen, I mean, yeah, you were on that list, but, you know, ministers, MPs, oh, and, you know, yeah, some people had to be casualties. You build a society like that, Someday it will come back to bite you. Like that saying goes, someday the poor will have nothing else to eat or feed on but the rich. So as you do all these things, someday, me, I've lived through war, where people who were rich left everything and had to run for their lives. So you think you are hoarding everything and even where you can pay because of political access, you will not pay. God forbid. But if that day were to come, all those things you have amassed will mean nothing to you. Think about it. Now, between 2019 and 2020, and these are not full figures. This is just what the fourth estate uncovered. Okay? Don't get it twisted. This is not like the whole thing. 2019 to 2020, money spent by the scholarship secretariat on influential individuals and associates of the political elite, 146000 $502. Do you know what that could do? How many students that could help in Ghana who need scholarships, even to study in our tertiary institutions? Do you know? Yeah, this, is, this is over what? One point, this, this is about 1.8 million plus Ghana cities right there that you're looking at. Can you imagine how many it will help? As, as a matter of fact, part of this was given to someone over 17,000 who was supposed to study in the UK. Fell ill, couldn't go, yet, of course, the payment had been made. So we've lost. That is financial loss to the state, by the way. We've caused financial loss to the state. No one is talking about it. Next slide. Then, it's not just that. Some enjoyed multiple <laughs> scholarships. Some awarded to NPP constituency executives in the Eastern region, totaling 57,210 Great British pounds. Next slide. Now, the special assistant to the second lady. This is a, a great time to be connected to the political elite, right? <laughs> she, that person got 57,210 to attend a university in the UK, but never set foot on campus and eventually dropped out of the program. The person never set foot there. But Charlie, it is what it is. Next slide. Then you look at the investigation, family members of the president and former finance minister, and there's that uh, Oforiata person in there. 
16,740. I'm talking Great British Pounds, not Ghana cities. Multiply by 16. Uh -huh. Daughter of the former IGP, 27,480. Children of two MPs, uh, so 19,130 and 36,675 um, respectively. And then daughter of the former national chairman of the MPP, 6,000 Great British Pounds. Next slide. So you look at it, and this is where I'll end for the bit on the scholarship secretariat. So multiple scholarships, 27. Multiple scholarships in consecutive years, 2019 and 2020, 2013. That's just for the fourth estate. When you add up these figures, even what we know, it's horrendous looking at where we are, how people are bleeding, suffering, day after day. Why do we do this? I was just telling Edem Agbana that politicians do this, including the NDC at some point. But what is happening now stinks to the high heavens. Why? Why? You are CEO of a, an institution. You own uh, a soccer team and all of Do you know what it takes to own a club? Do you know? You still are chasing the local fuel those down will use. Why? You own a major hospital. You own a health app. You, you are this, you are that. Kakra, omu omu wa fomu nso no, omu debe yo omu hui yedo, en no so ope sa oje. Ah, dang. Why are we so wicked? Unkwa ube di. Hmm? Ah, here na ube ti di. It's heartbreaking sometimes. Why? But let's continue with the conversation looking at the tablet saga. All of them are on education, so I decided to focus on that uh, today. There are some interesting things you ought to pay attention to. Now, one student, one tablet policy, by the way, promised all the way before even this government came into power, 2016, thereabouts. Why they do this, and the NDC has done it at some point, but especially now, why they do this, wait till an electoral year to do this, only God knows. Read between the lines. But cost per tablet, $250. Tablets, may I'll give you a breakdown, but what tablet is that? $250. Samsung, the NOKI is saying. Eh? I mean, sometimes these people think we are bereft of brains, eh? But anyway, number of tablets to be distributed, 1.3 million. The total cost, $325 million. That's a lot of oh, pay, 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 pay. I will say pay, pay till my lips get parched. Company in charge, KA Technologies. Let's go to the next slide. Now, if we come to the next slide, Stats Ghana put out something. The company that got the contract to supply the $320 million worth of, they say, Chinese tablets to our school kids is not registered in Ghana. But what is the truth? Because we ought to get into that. So the next slide actually reveals uh, something. When you go to the website of KU Technologies, they say it is an indigenous private limited liability company duly registered in Ghana under the Companies Act 2019. And it goes on and on. Uh, engaged in manufacturing, training, connectivity, and technology solutions for identifiable societal segments such as education, healthcare, and agriculture. You, I'll not bore you with the rest. Usually when you check these things and you go in it. Hmm. But you, let's go to the next slide. Because then we also take a look at the Registrar General's Department, their official page, and what they say about KA Technologies. So, entity name, we keyed in, KA Technologies. Search type, exact match. So there's no same thing. And you look at the search criteria and everything, but guess what? No records found. No records found. Oh, do you want me to repeat? No records found. So I don't know. They say they are homegrown indigenous and I guess this counts for nothing, right? Maybe. By media, I'm just exposing it. You do the thinking. I'm just doing the talking. Next slide. Then you have Dr. George and Nagli come and you know, talk about a few things. And you see why we should be you know, uh, holding some of this to strict proof, right? These tablets might be helpful to the students, but they are not needed now. It's not a priority. 
$325 million can do a whole lot. Remove some schools under trees, improve feeding for the students, renovate and equip some hospitals. This list can go on and on. Okokai, I see, hey, inti manu bukiti. To say each tablet costs $250 is just ridiculous. Now, laptop grab the how much? Now, you think of it. Even some of the latest laptops in the system. Do you know what $250 is? That is north of 3,000 CDs. In fact, recently, I helped someone get a laptop. Very good laptop. Guess how much? But we are getting a tablet. That kind of tablet, for that matter. $250. To those who are defending this, be honest with yourself. In your heart of hearts, you know this isn't needed now. It's a misplaced priority. You know it. Um, and it goes on and on. But, but let, me, let me get some reactions because um, let's go to the next, next slide. We have the education minister speak. He says, there is a difference between a budgetary allocation and a cash flow allocation. So even if I wanted to, the law does not allow me to tell GetFund that I need your money to buy food instead of the tablets you have allocated funds for in your funding formula. So there is a difference between a cash flow logistical issue and a budgetary issue. Mr. Education Minister, you've said a lot um, without necessarily hitting the nail on the head. Because guess what? Your administration caps the Get Fund and takes money that should go into education and uses it elsewhere. How about that? How about that? You may not have it in terms of what it's meant to be used for, but there's leverage you can use. So this excuse about <laughs> uh, the children are hungry. You are giving them tablets. The tablets then go job. It's a good thing. No one is saying it's a bad thing. But in this country, we are penny wise and pound foolish. Maka, maka. Next slide. And this is where we are going to wrap, right? Now, if you do the analysis, oftentimes politicians, it's, it's like you can put up a building and they'll tell you it's 10 million, but another entity puts up the same type of building with the same, and it's 1 million. You ask yourself, <laughs> what's the difference? What went into the two? Miracles happen in Ghana. If you look at it, we're spending north of 300 million, right? One student, one tablet, $325 million. But please, oh, let's do a bit of a breakdown. Mr. Shemwa, I'm going to Pokwasi, Obeche Bilamte, and Tamale interchanges. Total cost, $289 million. $289, three interchanges. UGMC, University of Ghana Medical Center, commissioned in 2017, or 2016, $217 million. But one student, one tablet, $325 million. And mind you, it is not like it's the Ghana city, so there's inflation. No, it's in dollars. We are quoting in dollars. But why should I be surprised? In 2016, the Cape Coast Stadium was put up for how much? 16, well, $32 million thereabouts, if I'm not mistaken. It was actually 16 million. Yeah, 16 or 17 million. And today we say that we've renovated the University of Ghana Stadium. And it's cost us more than twice of that price because it was 34 million for that renovation when the Cape Coast Stadium in 2016 went for $16 million. Miracles will never end in this country. But you see, as I end, all I'm going to say. I don't care whether you are NDC or MPP or whatever you are in between. If we don't start telling the truth to the people we elect to lead us, they will lead us deeper into the ditch. We're already in the ditch. They will lead us further down. And getting back out will be a terrible affair. No cre, asawagana. O kan no cre nzoa, ni e tatao, ba me de ma no bokiti. Makan, makan, obrafo. My name is Benjamin Akaku. These are my blunt thoughts shared with you, raw, hot, unedited, and diluted. Have a good day. Welcome back on the AM Show. Time now for us to get into our big stories. And our first conversation is with the chairman of the National Peace Council, Reverend Dr. Enes Edujimfi, and he joins us via Zoom. Good morning, Reverend. Thank you for joining us this morning. 
I think you have to unmute, Reverend. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, thanks for having me. Right. So this conversation is on your activities this election year, how you're planning to maintain preempt and all, you know, everything that comes to, has to do with peace this election year. How is your outfit doing? Is it busy around this time of year? <laughs> well, we've been busy uh, for the last three years, uh, even though the tempo has gone up a little bit since mm. December. Uh, we've been quite busy. Man. Right. So we know that in Africa, Ghana is one of the most, you know, peaceful countries or is described as one of the most peaceful countries and because we have a proper system like the National Peace Council that is legally mandated to handle issues of conflict and all that. But from time to time, we do experience some violence, whether it's from ethnic, religious, political, economic, and so forth. In this election year, how are you preparing to contain election violence? Thank you for that question. Um, our preparation for this year's election began from 2021 mm. and since uh, after the last election um, the peace council conveyed a, a high level uh, meeting in Abda to evaluate whatever happened in the 2020 elections and out of that uh, a dialogue for four days uh, we were given a roadmap as to some of the things that we needed to put in place before this election and so we have been working along all these uh, on this path, trying to look at all the key issues that uh, were assigned to us. We began with uh, a meeting with the Electoral Commission to look at a few key issues. Uh, we've had meetings with the security agencies. We've met with the IGP. We've met with the Chief of Defense Staff. We provided training and interface between the police political parties and civilians. We've had another meeting between the police and the political parties alone so that they could talk among themselves and iron out all the differences and the suspicion. Then we have also had various meetings with the political parties. Currently, since the beginning of last year, we've set up the political party trust building platform where we mm. meet quarterly with the parties to discuss key issues and things that are bothering them. And we all meet, we talk, and we take, make decisions. Besides that, we've been also having training programs for the political parties. We just had a training for them on the alternative dispute resolution right. to help them in terms of their own internal issues and how they can resolve them, and the need to uh, find alternative ways of resolving problems instead of going to the courts. We've also had sessions with their women leaders, their youth leaders, and their communicators. And all of these things are meant to tone down the tension in the country. Two weeks ago, we met with all the council of elders of all the parties, also to share with them all the things that we've done so far with the various groups within the party. And then uh, we also had some other programs that were outside the key political party sphere. Uh, we were charged with the responsibility of making sure that the NPC, uh, NDC returns to IPAC. Yeah. It took us three years to work on this. In December last year, we were able to get NDC back to IPAC. The other responsibility that was assigned to us was to also uh, find out if we could talk with the judiciary to reduce the time frame for adjudicating parliamentary election uh, cases. You know, we've been able to bring the presidential to about 42 days, even though the last one went over 50 days. Mm. And so we went through that negotiation. Finally, uh, the judiciary was able to come up with something. And uh, last, uh, early this week, we had a meeting with all the parties and key stakeholders also to discuss that with them. Besides right. that, we've been having meetings across the country. All our regional peace councils are very, very active. And yesterday, we brought together all the regional chair, chairmen of all the regional peace councils to another closed door meeting to evaluate what they're doing, what we are doing to share notes so that they can go back and uh, effectively work. What so are these some are the, some of the things that we... Right. What are some of the highlights of that meeting, that closed door meeting? 
Is it between the judiciary and the parties or the peace council? No, the, the parties. What are some of the, the, the key issues that came out well, from that meeting? There were six major issues that mm. were presented. Uh, the first one was to clarify, uh, in terms of adjudicating of care, parliamentary election cases, mm. the issue was when is election declared or when is the winner declared? Now, in the current uh, uh, re regulation, the airline that regulates the election, the election results are declared at the polling station and the constituency. Mm. And then the EC must gazette the results within a certain time frame. And after the results are gazetted, you have 21 days to file whatever case you had. Now, the gazetting of the results even though it's the work of the EC, is actually not in their hands because it's with the Ghana publishing. It takes time to go through this. And the last election, even though the results were declared around the 8th, 9th, 10th, mm. uh, most of them had been declared, gazetting took place on the 22nd, which means that it was done 12 days after. Mm -hmm. And then whoever had the case had to have 21 days within that period to file the case. Then the respondent has about seven days to respond and then they go through all kinds of things before. By the time the case itself is ready to be heard, we already passed two months. So those were critical issues. In this particular meeting, we came to the agreement that if election results are declared at the constituency and the constituency returning officer has the power to declare the results, then why don't we accept that as soon as the results are declared in the constituency, it is accepted as declared? So that whoever has a grievance can immediately pro uh, proceed to the court and file you or whatever it is and, and move on. The second thing that we had to look at was how many days, within 21 days and, and then, then uh, before all these other processes could start, mm. is it possible to shorten the days? And so the judiciary brought a proposal of seven days, seven uh, days. The parties were conflicted. Some of them were suggesting, let's maintain a 21, let's go to 14. But after, after a lot of discussion, I think the consensus was around the 14 days. But we left to the judiciary to look at it and see how uh, those processes uh, could be worked out. So then as it stands now, it means that... you're, you're waiting on the judiciary to bring you the, fin the, you know, the final uh, conclusion on that matter, whether it will be 21 that's, that's days correct. or 14 we, days. We have come to some agreements, but okay. you know, they have to uh, get the bill sent to parliament, you go through approval processes right. and all of those, right? Mm. So we have come to certain conclusions, but then they have to tell them into a bill that goes into parliament, they have to come with the ally and all of those that regulates the election. Mm. So we don't, we wouldn't say that what we've done now is very conclusive, okay. but we've come to some agreement that we believe that once the parties have agreed to these things, they will talk to their parliamentary uh, what candidates, yeah. so that once the issue comes to parliament, they have an understanding of what, what we have discussed. So we don't keep dragging, we, we don't have too much time yeah. uh, in terms of dealing with this, these things. So how much? The second how thing was soon do you think you can conclude on that matter? Because again, you said you don't I have think too that much time. From, yeah. from what we've done now, mm. um, they should be ready to, to move as soon as practicable. Because we all recognize that we don't have enough time uh, between now and the election period getting these things through parliament, getting your allies done and all of those things takes a lot of time. Okay. So I think they will be moving immediately. That was why we convened this emergency. In fact, the judiciary were on a break, mm. but because of the urgency of the matter, they were ready to come in and we have five of the justices of the Supreme Court who participated in this meeting, which means that they gave priority to the, the issues that we raised. Right. The second thing was on seven processes. When uh, somebody files a case, mm -hmm. you have to serve on the other person. Now, we noticed that there were challenges in some of these things. Sometimes people evaded service and all kinds of things. At this meeting, the proposal that came up was that when somebody is filing to contest, you give your email address, you give your WhatsApp address, your phone number and all of those things to the electoral commission. It's part of your filing processes. Now, if your phone number is there, your email address is there, your WhatsApp number is there, then that is the means by which you can be reached. So, service will not necessarily be a bailiff bringing something into your hands. We can do service by WhatsApp, by email, and once your WhatsApp ticks and we see that it has ticked, 
it is assumed that you have received it. Okay. An email, we can set up services, a uh, system such that once you, you read the email, it reflects back. We yes. know you've read it. Yes. So those are things that we put in place so that people don't start dodging each other and running around where a parliamentary candidate is elected. Yeah, the, the case drags through court a year, two years. We've had a case where by the time the case was determined, parliament was over. So we looked at those things. Then we dealt with the length of days uh, in terms of the fact that the current situation, you have 21 days to uh, file, somebody has another number of days to respond and all of those yes. things. So those days were also looked at. And then we tried to shorten them. Instead of, let's say, seven working days, it's not just seven days. So weekends are counted as part of the days. So that those were major issues. Then the, looking at all of these things that we have discussed, there's a need to amend the current allies that are regulating the elections. Mm -hmm. So those issues were also critically discussed. We came to a certain agreement that all these issues that we are raising now uh, should be affected in terms of the ally to determine how these things are done. Then there was the issue of cases, how the cases are handled. Uh, currently, the whoever files a case against an individual, those cases are handled within either the region, the constituency, wherever there's a high court. Now, we notice that there could be a case where one high court may have several cases to handle, and those things could also delay the processes. And so the suggestion was that if no one judge will have more than one case at a time in terms of parliamentary uh, uh, adjudication. Mm. So if there's a case in one court and another case comes up, then the case will be handed over to the next immediate high court that is closest to the constituency. And we came up with some formula between the first case and then the next immediate, assuming we had three cases, who will be the next person to handle those things? So that we remove the suspicion that the chief justice assigned the case to this person because the person has a political interest or whatever it is. So we have given out a certain formula to handle these things. What's, to ensure what's that, that formula? Please shed a little more light so, on that. Yeah. Right. If, assuming something happens in the Medina constituency, then we are handling in the High Court in Medina. If there are two or more cases within that, uh, that enclave, then the next case might probably be handed over to the next court, in, let's say, Adenta, which right. is the closest. Okay. If there are two more cases, let's move the next case to, let's say, Abokobi. Right. right. So that no one judge will have more than one case to handle to ensure that we get these things done as soon as practicable. And by these things that we have done, we were anticipating that latest within two months, we should be able to resolve all these parliamentary cases so that we have the full complement of parliament. The other thing is that the president is supposed to choose some of his ministers and others from parliament. So when there are all these delays, it affects the, uh, the, uh, what the, the proposal from the president in terms of the kind of people that he wants to choose. Mm. So we want to avoid some of these things. The last issue we dealt with will not affect this current election, but that has to do with all these proposals that we put in place. The objective was that, is it possible for us to have all these cases resolved before the 7th of January? So by the time a president sits in, is sworn in, he has a full complement of people to work with, and then we can move forward. In, in, if we want to resolve the case within two months, that is up to the end of January, is it possible to shift the election to November so that we have those two months to deal with these things? Then by the 7th of January, the president is, is, is sworn in, mm. parliament is sworn in, and we have the full complement of people to work with. But we notice that bringing this issue now, because EC took it uh, to IPAC, it was shut down, we don't want to create any problem, and we don't have time to go into that debate. Mm. But we agree that this is necessary, so that after this election, from next year, proposals on these things will start. And we all agreed that all proposals on election reform should start early. Nothing should wait till the last year when people become too suspicious. You are changing the rules because of this or because of that. So early next year, that proposal will come up.
so that by 2028, election will be moved early, maybe to November, so that we can uh, have all these issues resolved before the 7th of December. So these were the six key issues that we, we discussed mm. and came to some uh, some conclusions on. So we right. left it over with the judiciary. And uh, we had very good representation at the meeting. Uh, five justices of the Supreme Court were there. The political parties were highly represented with their legal uh, uh, participants. Right. And very good, very healthy discussion. And so we believe that going forward, uh, we should be able to have these issues resolved. Okay. And I want to say good job on um, getting the NDC to return back to IPAC. I think since they returned, they've attended about two meetings already. How challenging was that? It took you three years. Well, it was not an easy thing. You know, after the last election, there were all kinds of uh, issues, and, uh, accusations, counter-accusations, suspicion, and all of that. And so it took uh, quite a while. The process began with the old administration of the NDC and MPP, uh, Fusan Kofu, mm. Stephen Ketia, Freddie Blay, uh, and others, we, we, we began the discussion. We had to take them to a hotel somewhere uh, to talk. Yeah. Uh, they agreed on certain things. We wanted to bring the EC in. It was difficult getting them in. We went forward and backwards. Uh, we had to go back door to talk to President Mahama at a certain point. You know, a lot of background work was done. Mm. And then until we finally got to a point where we were able to get the NDC back. Right. So now, does the NPC have a database or conflict zones or may a comprehensive mapping or map out of conflict hotspots so you can preempt what um, conflicts this election? Yes, we okay. do have that. We did that with the University of Cape Coast. So we have all the hotspots in the country mapped up. But then we keep reviewing these things because mm. uh, conflict is quite fluid. Uh, right. Sometimes something small sparks up somewhere, and then suddenly uh, the whole country is in trouble. So we keep reviewing some of these things. And then at certain points, we realize that some of the interventions that we put in minimizes some conflicts in some areas. Then other areas also are heightened. So we keep monitoring these things, and uh, we have an eye on all of those things. And we challenge all the regional peace councils also to monitor these areas carefully. And a lot of work is going on in, in most of those places. What does this work look like? <laughs> we we set up peace ambassadors who yeah. are constantly working in there. We do training on violent extremism within those places. Between We've had training for pain mothers. We have youth. We are currently in secondary schools. We've done training for tertiary yeah. institution leaders. Uh, we get into all those communities, and right. then we keep, we keep working in, in those places. OK. Recently, the flag bearer of, or the leader of the Movement for Change made some comments and it received a lot of backlash that it was instigating violence. He said that um, Christians should vote for a Christian leader. We've seen most of the other parties come out to say that that's a, a statement that was flawed. We haven't seen anything yet from the NPC. How do you react to a statement like that? Well, I think on the 15th of November last year, mm. the NPC issued a press release in, uh, in partnership with the Christian Council of Ghana, the Catholic Bishops Conference, the Office of the National Peace Imam. And in fact, later on, the uh, Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council even wanted to join in that, that statement, where we told the public that let's avoid religion in politics. The fact is that for anybody who is done peace studies, religion, tribe, uh, ethnicity are major issues in conflict. Once it sparks, these are things that touches the life of people. And therefore, they react violently to some of these things. And so we've been cautioning the public and all the political players, let us avoid going into that space. Now, when we did it initially, the tension came down, especially immediately after the MPP elected this flag bearer. Mm. That issue came up strongly and all over social media. So we had to provide an intervention immediately. It stopped. Now we are seeing pockets of it coming again. So we want to remind the public that we have already issued a press release cautioning the whole public, let's avoid 
in, uh, uh, religion coming into our politics. We have lived as one people. I went to school initially with Muslims, friends. I used to tell my police on the Peace Council, I used to live in Asafu, very close to the Media Mosque. My landlord, my mother's landlord at the time was a Muslim. We lived in that house. We played with the kids. Sometimes after we played football, we went to the mosque. I didn't know what they were doing, but I went there with them. When they bow, I bow. When they get up, I get up. We, we were friends. We've lived together up to this point. Why are we now creating this conflict among ourselves? Mm -hmm. We've had schoolmates, we have classmates, we have workmates. We won't live together. So why are we suddenly bringing this thing into our country that can create division? So we want to appeal to all the players. Let us stay focused. What do you want to do for this country? What can you do best? For which reason you are asking people to vote for you? And let's put religion and ethnicity on the side. It will not help anybody. Well, it's not uncommon that some of these political leaders, party leaders, flag bearers, will still flounce these directions and appeal that you're um, appealing to them. Should that happen? What's punishment could be meted out to them? Are there any repercussions well, for going contrary to these directives? The, the mandate of the National Peace Council does mm. not make room for us to uh, meet out any punishment to anybody right. or any sanction. Mm. Right. But as part of the work we've done with the parties, we had political party code of conduct. Uh, but a month ago, when we met with the parties, they agreed that we set up a committee to monitor those things. So we are in the process of putting that committee together. At our next meeting, we we'll present the names to them for their approval so that they themselves will call out their own people and tell them that what you're saying is not right. We shouldn't go this way. We shouldn't go that way. We think that if they police themselves, it will be better for us than for us to go back and say, I condemn this and I condemn that. Mm. For us, because we are mediators, we try to avoid condemnation because when issues come up, it will still come back to us to resolve. So we don't want to take a position where it, it gives an impression as if you are biased when you are adjudicating uh, or trying to mediate between uh, issues. So those are the reasons why we have avoided condemning and all of those things. But they, and again, we must make clear that we don't have the mandate to do that. And so we don't tread into those things. But we are working with fact check Ghana now, uh, trying to ensure that when people make statements, sometimes the headlines may be different from exactly what the person said. So we send the information immediately to fact check. Fact check looks at it, gives us a feedback, and then we know that this information is credible. Can we act on it? Sometimes we call the people to our office, we sit down with them and say, look, we are gentlemen, you are honorable people, we want to rule this country, let's not go on this path. Sometimes some of them, by the time they get to the office, they start apologizing. We said this, uh, we didn't mean it, and then all of those things. But we keep mm. cautioning them that, look, let us maintain the peace and stability of our country. It's the most important thing for us to do now. The National Peace Council has come under scrutiny, not scrutiny per se, individuals like Sam George have have some bad things to say about your stance on this anti-LGBTQ plus bill. Again, like you said again this morning, you are a mediator, so you do not want to take a stance. But this bill or this conversation has become very crucial because a lot of people have differing opinions on the way that the government or the country should go. How do you respond to those who are criticizing your stance on this? Let's look at a very critical situation. Hmm. Because of this bill, there's a conflict between the speaker and the president. Mm. Which institution in this country can resolve this apart from the Peace Council? <laughs> so well, if the Peace Council mandate, has taken the so... position, <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we need to think about it. If the Peace Council has taken a position, will we have the right to even attempt to mediate? People are calling on us. Why is the Peace Council quiet? Can't you people help to mediate in this matter and all of those? All those discussions are going on. So the council does not take a position. When there is a major conflict, we are the only people people can call upon. Right now, is the speaker ready to back up and say that I have withdrawn? Is the president ready to back up? Somebody must come in between. And people are appealing to the Peace Council. Why don't you step into this matter and help resolve this thing? So the public must understand the role of the Peace Council. We just don't get into anything. We sit back. 
And initially, when I gave that interview on TV3, I said that, that we don't take a position. If there's a conflict, and someone said, but there's a conflict, I said, we haven't gotten to that point yet. But look at where we are now. You need an institution to step in. And the Peace Council is the only institution that can do this work now. So the public must understand our role. When we say that we don't take a position, it doesn't that mean that individuals don't say it. I said it on, on doing that interview. Mm. Everybody on the council, I represent the Christian council. Christian council has spoken. The office of the chief imam has spoken. Traditional rulers have spoken. Mm. The council of Christ, everybody has spoken. So why are you forcing the Christian council to make a statement? <laughs> And the council is made up of representatives of these institutions. But what we've said is that our institutions can say whatever they want to say. Mm. But for the Peace Council, we need to remain neutral so that whenever the conflict gets to a certain point, that means resolution, we can step in and deal with the matter. So I think it's important that the, the public understands our mandate. Ours is not to condemn, ours is not to align. We stay in the middle and do the best we can to resolve whatever impasse we have. Right. So now there's uh, reports, there have been news about arms and even conflicts tripping down into Ghana from our neighboring um, countries like Burkina Faso and, and the rest. I'd like to know what your assessment of that situation is and how you're working to ensure that we still, maintain, we still enjoy the peace that we are enjoying in this country currently and not the influx of these wars on our bordering countries don't you know, upset the peace we are enjoying. It's, it's a major threat to our country, and especially for us, uh, because we are not into the issue of arms and all of that. That's the responsibility of the, the Small Arms Commission. Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, the chair of the Small Arms Commission is also a member of the Peace Council. So once we are doing these discussions, he knows where we're going. Right. You know, so we leave that with Small Arms to handle. Ours is to ensure that we continue to provide education on violent extremism so that we don't get into a situation where everybody starts shooting somebody because of some, something very trivial. So that is what we've been doing and providing training. Most of our uh, regional peace councils in the border towns are actively working in those areas. Mm. Uh, getting to the Bono areas, getting to Cote d'Ivoire, the northern part of the country and all yeah. of those. A lot of work is going on. There is very active work going on in all the five northern regions. Uh, with a lot of support from USAID and several institutions dealing with the issue of violent extremism and how we can tone these things down. Mm. So for Peace Council, ours, ours is to talk to people to help them to understand that we may disagree, but it does not necessarily mean we have to fight. We may disagree, we, we don't have to pull a gun and, and pull a, a machete and kill somebody. So those are the things we keep telling our public. Let us talk, let us resolve our problems. And let us not go on that route. Now, once we don't deal with the violent extremism, it also emboldens these extremists who are outside our country to come in. And those are the, the things that we keep questioning our people. Mm -hmm. Extremists are looking for opportunities to step into a given situation. So when we create the unnecessary tension and the violence, it gives them the opportunity to move in. And right now, the number of arms in this country is frightening. Mm. And we, especially within the northern part of our country. And it's now, in, in the past, people were looking at having a motorbike as a prestige in some of those places. Now, the prestige is I must have a, a gun. And the House of Skidder, my gun is, shows where my position is. And these are things that we, uh, we are uh, talking with our partners in terms of this, this work uh, to do the best we can. We've talk, spoken to the police, we've spoken to uh, the other security agencies monitor these things. Let's help to bring it down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also think that the media must help us in terms of public education in this area so that we can reduce the tension as much as possible. Thank you so much, Reverend. But we cannot let you go. I cannot let you go without your message of peace to the good people of this country, especially this year, come December. What would that be? We want to appeal to all Ghanaians. Uh, Election is competition, and for every competition, people will agitate and do all manner of things. But let us remember that in the midst of all the things we are doing, we have only one country to live in. And therefore, in the midst of our competition, let's be careful of what we say, how we say it, so that we can maintain the peace, the stability, the security of our country. It's in the midst of peace 
that businesses can run. It's in the midst of peace our schools can run. It's in the midst of peace that everybody can go about his or her normal duties peacefully. So let us do the best we can to maintain the peace of our country. Thank you so much. Reverend Dr. Enes Edujemfi is chairman of the National Peace Council. It was a pleasure chatting with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Right, so there you have it. But there's still more to come. Right now, Benjamin is coming to do some analysis on data from Global Info Analytics on what people are saying they will do come election 2024. Stay for that conversation. Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to get into what the political crystal ball uh, is revealing. And we're going to conduct an analysis on a research, a survey put together by Global Info Analytics. They've been doing this for quite a while. And per the latest statistics that we're getting, they believe 65% uh, of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction compared to 25% who believe it is actually headed in the right direction. Uh, direction. There are many other dynamics uh, to look at, but the man himself behind the outfit, Musa Dankwa, is in uh, the studio and he's joining me for a conversation. Musa, good morning. Good morning to you. I hope you're well. Doing very well, thank you. All right. So here we are, the latest survey from April the 4th, 4th April 2024. So the fourth day of the fourth month. Just walk us through what exactly the basics are of this. Um, as we normally do, uh, we went around the country mm. uh, every 90 days. Uh, we spoke to 6,128 uh, voters across all the 16 regions and from 82 constituencies, uh, randomly on the street. And this is one of the things we do in order to be able to understand very well what's going to happen in December 2024. So this is the start of the question. In fact, this is the question one we ask voters. Okay. Uh, the first question, in your view, do you believe that Ghana is heading in the right direction or wrong direction? We believe that it's a very important question because it tends to correlate with how they intend to vote in the end and many other factors. So this is one of the important questions we ask. Uh, and we've been tracking this question for the past in fact, uh, since January 2022. So every time we go and we track it. So we have a tracking poll showing where we were as a country way back in 2002, uh, 2022, and now. So you can see the trend line for such questions. I see. So you, you talk about some of these latest dynamics. You say 65% of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. 62% disapprove of President Okufuado's performance, and 52% of voters believe the government has performed very poorly. But let me, let me, let me ask this. Um, what is the sample size? How many people were you interacting with? Where were you interacting with them? Um, we interviewed um, 6,128 voters from 82 constituencies. 6,000 how many? 128. 6,128, right. No, you can go ahead. From all the 16 regions and across 82 constituencies. Okay. And uh, predominantly, so when you say 82 constituencies, what was the spread? Is it even per, because the no, voter populations are different. It's Some not are even, higher and all of that. Even. So. In fact, um, the samples are deployed 20% in Greater Accra because most voters are in Greater Accra in that mm. proportion. 18% mm. were deployed in Ashanti region. 
10% were deployed in eastern region, 9% for central region, 7% for western region, 6 for northern region, Volta 6%, Bono 4%, Upper East 4%, Bono East 4%, Upper West 3%, Western North 2%, OT 2%, Savannah 2%, Northeast 2%, and Ava 2%. So it is uh, uh, proportional to the number of voters who live in those uh, regions. I see. Um, we'll look at the regional breakdowns and all of that, but essentially, what, what are the major bits that we should be looking at based on the survey? You've mentioned some of them, 6,128 sampled, 16 regions, 82 constituencies, and of course, you use the weighted uh, system uh, in there. In terms of your methodology, uh, you, you have a confidence level of 99%, a margin of error of 1.66%. Uh, uh, you also say the Electoral Commission's 2023 voters register was used as your sample frame and that 30% of constituencies from each region um, was randomly selected and allocated the regional quota based on total voters in each of the selected constituencies. Does that mean you find this to be a watertight very, survey? Very, very. But you know you could easily get it wrong. Polls get it wrong all the time. No, within the margin of error. You see, um, the way you structure the question also counts. Mm. Which question do you ask first? Also, are they leading questions? Are they... Exactly. Are they... And also, even how you are reading the questions. For example, we have a question which asks people about their political affiliation. But that question comes at the very end of the survey. Because we believe that when you ask that question from the beginning, people will begin to behave MPP, behave NDC. Mm. So they didn't expect us to ask them that question. But that is the last question we ask you. And at that point, you have no chance to go back and alter your answers. I see. In the weighting system, 6% uh, given to the Volta region, 18% to the Ashanti region, 20% to the Great Accra region. And you've given us some, um, you know, delineations of why. But when it comes to gender, mm. what picture do we see? The gender, uh, we normally rely, try to balance the gender in the field, physically. Mm. Um, it's around 49% women and 51 male around, along the, uh, the, the population generally why do you use that though because no, no. in terms of the, say, the real population no, there are more men now than women according to the new census oh yes it's changed really it's, it's flipped more men now than yeah, women 51 percent men and roughly 49 oh i get i get what you mean yeah. it was slightly yeah slightly. it's borderline yes. right so now. what we do is that in the field we try to balance the quota in the field by sampling women and make sure that we are reached within that range but sometimes in certain areas you don't get the male at a certain point in time. And at a certain point in time, you find only female. So we're mm. trying to balance it. Like, okay, in the morning, we try and get the, the woman. In the evening, you get the male. But you're not always going to be perfectly right. But we believe that in elections in this country, it's not gender-based. You know, that political party affiliation is more important than the, gender, than the gender of voters. I see. And I'm seeing something here that says 46% uh, that is the female and 54% male yeah. other groupings are also in there but in terms of education mm -hmm. the the people you're speaking to what what caliber of people are you speaking to what is their educational background it's a mix it's also important in yes, like yes, this. yes senior high were 38 percent of the respondents mm. and then junior high about 17 percent mm. uh, 18 percent had no formal education and then tertiary 26 percent do you know why this is interesting because of free SHS. Yes. The number in there, in fact, that's the highest. Yes. If you add the number for junior high to the number for no education, it's, it's just around what you would get. In fact, 35%. It's even less than what you would get for the, the senior high Block. bracket, those in senior high school. But, but, but what, what was the, those from the senior high schools? Can you tell us briefly where they were leaning towards in, in terms of these questions? What were the answers like? Um, if you look at the... Uh, question about the direction of the country. Everybody, every demography is saying that we're heading the wrong way. Even those benefiting from yes. free SHS? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So it's a across board feeling. And in fact, every region says not in the right path. Then, right before we get into the regions and what they say, in terms of work, and I'm just letting us break down so from gender to schooling, education to work. 
Retired, 2%. Other 4%. Those who didn't answer, 7%. Government or NGO, 11%. Casual workers, 12%. Unemployed, 12%. Private companies, 14%. Students, 15%. 15%. Self-employed, 46%. And when you take a look at religion, uh, traditional religion, 3%. Others, 2%. Non-religious, 5%. Islam, 20%. Christianity, 70%. I'm interested in this because... Some people like to play the religious card. You, you heard recently Alan Chebating mm -hmm. say that mm -hmm. we need a Christian uh, leader. The vice president, some have uh, flayed him because some say he is Christian at some point and Muslim at some point, but he is Muslim. We know that. It, how relevant is this statistic, religion and, and the, the voting pattern? Um, I would say it is relevant in the context of the Christians. Mm because the poll shows that Muslims are less influenced by the religion of the candidates. Oh, really? Yes. Religion doesn't really matter to them. To the Muslims. Christian or Muslim? No, the, the Muslims. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, it, it yeah, doesn't matter, matter to them who... whether the person is Christian or Muslim. No. They don't really matter. It doesn't matter to them. I see. It's the Christian that some of them have uh, the feeling that we must be led by our own. Mm -hmm. And I think at the moment, about 16% of voters said religion will matter to them in 2024 elections down from 24%, which is an improvement from the last poll. Mm. And when I look at the religious stratification, even among Christians, Pentecostals that you spoke to accounted for 20%, Charismatic 17%, Presbyterian 17%, Catholic 15%, and it goes on and on, Anglican 6% and all. But let's get to, and, and with the Muslims, the Islamic sects, Sunni 59%, Ahmadiyya 16%, Tijaniya 12%, other 7%, Shia, six uh, percent and then the ethnic groups it's interesting because you spoke to a lot more accounts because that's what that's, way more no in 46 no I, I i mean i'm not criticizing you but that is i guess the the statistic is yes. i can 46 percent yes. others 13 percent ever 11 percent gadangwe 11 percent mole dagbani 10 percent one six percent grushi two percent gurma one percent and monday one percent but why why this though no, it reflects the current mm. structure of our ethnic groups in Ghana. If you okay. look at numbers, these numbers are consistent with it. Mm. It means that if you are doing random sampling truly on the street, the, the, what you find in, in, on the street will be what GSS has on their system. Accounts are roughly around 40% of the population. And then in terms of the party affiliations, right before I go to Dr. Michael Ayamga, uh, the 90-day moving average together with uh, the first-time voters, what's, what's the pattern? What does it reveal for no, them? We have seen a, a, a decline in the number of people who openly say they are MPP. Openly. A decline in the people who openly they say they are MPP. Profess they are yes. members of the MPP. Yes, yes. And we've seen that of NDC stating study, or in some cases going up. And then also we've seen a, 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 an increase in those who refuse to declare their party affiliation. And that number moves in the opposite direction with MPP. When MPP goes down, that number goes up. I see. And then in terms of first-time voters, we've seen the uh, majority of them either seeing their MPP or floating voters, sorry, NDC or floating voters than MPP. In the current poll, among first-time voters, um, about 25% of them said they are NDC. Mm -hmm. 26 are floating voters. 23 did not disclose their party affiliation, and MPP is 22%. So they are not openly... So it's a three percentage gap between the NDC and yes. the MPP. Yes. The NDC in the lead there, yes. but the real concern is the floating voters, yes. 26%. Yeah, they are going up, yes. Because if you add even, what, 20% to any of these parties, they are, they are almost home, home free. Yeah. Okay. Let me bring in Dr. Michael Ayamga. Uh, Doc, good morning. Thank you for joining the conversation. Hello, Dr. Ayamga. You may have to unmute if it's not already. I think I'm on. Okay, I'm muted. I can hear you now, Doc. Um, okay. I, I want to believe you've seen the recent poll by Global Info Analytics. Um, Mr. Musa Dankwa is here in the studio with us. It evinces that 65% of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, 62% disapprove of President Ekufuado's performance, and 52% believe the government has performed very poorly. Uh, would you give credence to looking at the times and the research patterns from Global Info Analytics? 
what would be your reading of what, what they are showing? It, it appears things are getting even worse. Yeah, I would uh, like to characterize this survey as something that is a barometer, just gives an indication of uh, how people are feeling at this time, rather than uh, it being a reflection of the percentages. The percentages are taken uh, uh, way, 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 way worse than they are for the president and for the MPP. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, data is no uh, less an indication that uh, the country is not going the right direction. Uh, I am particularly uh, concerned with a few things in the methodology, just a couple of things. So you can quickly walk yeah. us through that. Yes. Very quickly, uh, very so quickly. Yes, first of all, <clears throat> one of the challenges I have with this, they are taking 30% of constituencies in uh, the region, and then you realize that they are very uh, partisan uh, constituencies. For example, if you take 30% of Asante region, and then you add Asawasi inside there, what you are doing is actually overestimating the NDC's uh, uh, strength in there, because you more or less be talking about an extreme value uh, for the NDC in that context, and then a central or a, a medium value for uh, uh, the new patriotic party uh, that matter. So uh, I feel that... So, so in other words, that, in, that, in that instance, yes. it would favor the NDC? The NDC, yes. Yes, so that is the, 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 the reality I'm seeing here. I would have wished that they try to make uh, the proportion or the the, the, the weight of uh, Asawasi in the whole uh, voter population that Central Region reflect rather than uh, just putting it in uh, there. And I think it also speaks volumes for uh, uh, the same for uh, other uh, 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 MPP in the Volta Region and the rest. So you may say there may be a counseling out effect there, but uh, going forward, I wish to see uh, uh, these constituencies that tend to be outliers. Uh, uh, well managed so that they don't end up uh, uh, giving some false hope to some people or making some people feel unnecessarily depressed. I also see something that worries me, and that is the gender. Uh, I've seen that we have moved away from the non -bi uh, the binary characterization of gender to include other. And when I saw that, I was beginning to question uh, the rationale for that and uh, why we felt the need to add another to our, uh, uh, research. I'm not in any way trying to talk about the rights issues here. I'm just talking about the conventional practices that we have engaged in over the years. And if you even look, go to, you see that uh, in some of them, you have number of people entering them. Uh, in, on page nine that I am in there, you can see that for Bono, you have two people entering. And throughout, you see uh, uh, people entering uh, other. And I'm asking, why the need for that. If you now go way, 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 way back to the point where we are talking about the uh, LGBTQ plus uh, issues, you realize that uh, it seems to tie into why uh, this uh, data, and that uh, worries me. Uh, I feel extremely uh, uh, sad when I see statistics being played with, because it's my passion, I love it, and uh, we should always uh, uh, try to, to, to keep things the way they are. You go to the Upper West Region, the most conservative... And maybe, maybe, can. Maybe, maybe we can make that the final point because we have to get into yes, the that, main statistics. That's what I'm saying. If you look at that, then you go to the Upper West Region, which I say is the most conservative region in Ghana. There are other Catholics or Muslims, largely. And uh, if you see the relative uh, 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 indifference to the issue of LGBTQ, uh, it, it worries me. And I think that that, 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 that portion of the study uh, raises uh, red flags, and uh, I don't know why uh, that has been the case, especially moving to a non-binary categorization of uh, gender in our research. I don't know when that starts. So, so I, I will I will leave uh, Musa Dankwa when I get to him to answer those uh, questions. But generally, when you look at the figures, like I mentioned, you say that they could even be higher than I mean, the 65% of voters believing Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, 62% uh, disapproving of President Okufuado's performance, and 52% believing the government had performed very badly. Since you are into 
uh, the core research. When you look at the distribution of MPP voters, for example, you have 2% from the Ahafu region, 23% um, from the Ashanti region, and which are the others? Central region, 12%, Eastern region, 15%. These are crucial regions I am mentioning. Uh, the Greater Accra region, 18%. Uh, percent. And then the distribution of NDC voters, uh, you have the Ahafu region, 1%, 10% uh, in the Ashanti region. Let's go to their stronghold, uh, the Volta region, 10%. Then Greater Accra region, 26%. What picture does that paint for you in terms of the distribution of voters from either of the political parties? Yes, and I think uh, uh, Usain pointed one important uh, indicator to see people who are moving increasingly away from the MPP, uh, benefiting the NDC or becoming undecided. Uh, it's a position no polit politician wants to be in. At, at a point where you already have very serious problems with your own core base, it means that you have a lot of homework to do before you even start pursuing floating voters and then those that uh, vote in other areas. So I would say that uh, it is a big challenge, but it reflects the trend in the country that uh, the MPP is no longer an attractive brand for these elections. Uh, you have people walk around and they want to dissociate themselves uh, from the MPP because of what they are going through. Uh, one of the easiest ways you can observe that is to normally look at the sheds and other things. You increasingly see uh, people now are not wanting to go and sit under these uh, shares and all those things. So uh, it's a key challenge and a big issue for uh, the MPP as far as uh, this election uh, is concerned. Everything is uh, uh, pointing to a, a very significant defeat for the MPP if these numbers pull. If nothing dramatic happens to change uh, the, the things in this country and the livelihoods of people, which I doubt will happen. I told you the other time, we could well be uh, uh, asking Mohammed who is going to be in this government when we meet you next time. You say a significant uh, defeat, and um, I do not know, I mean, technically what that would, that would signal, but uh, later I'll get to Musa Dankwa on that because he was mentioning some figures. When you look at the floating voters, right before I come back to Musa Dankwa and, and get some responses, you would see something interesting. When you look at the Greater Accra region, where the largest density of votes comes, even before the Ashanti region, uh, the floating voters are as high as 22% from this survey. Then you have 13% from the Ashanti region. In the Eastern region, 10%. In the Volta region, 6%. And in the Eastern region, like I mentioned earlier, 10%. How, how much of a role, per this analysis, how much of a role do you feel floating voters will pay, uh, play in the election? Especially if you pay attention to the fact that before, when it spoke about the voting patterns and those aligned to parties, I think 22% for the MPP, 25% uh, for the NDC, and 26% floating voters. How crucial, per this survey and generally, do you feel floating voters will be come election 2024? Yes, the issue is they are going to be the decider in the elections. Uh, you can look at uh, the scenario where they are more predisposed to uh, not going to vote at all. That is uh, the danger uh, in here, and that should be bad news for the MPP if uh, these people decide not to go and vote. Mm. Uh, the other thing, the NDC has a lot of work to do to uh, attract these uh, people. Uh, the base of the, uh, the National Democratic Congress is charged. Uh, uh, they are bearing the brunt of uh, the uh, non-inclusive growth and development that we are currently experiencing in the country. So if you talk of the poor NDC people, you can forget of that. They are going to stick with their candidate. The other issue is whether the party is structuring itself uh, well enough to attract these floating voters who mostly, uh, I can say, feel unwelcome with a highly partisan nature of things currently uh, going on. Uh, uh, we are hung around some here in the West. There are a lot of people who are undecided, but we don't think uh, the NDC is welcoming enough. Uh, they can belong there. And I think that it's a lot of work for them to do. Uh, 
they, they are currently very busy uh, uh, working and posting pictures and uh, local like when you are working you are already in there and that excludes and dispels uh, uh, these floating voters who want to engage on the uh, issues when uh, the NDC needs to work uh, uh, hard to make itself attractive to these people, especially people in the intelligentsia and people up there, they, they, they mostly would feel that they are not uh, uh, welcome in the NDC. So the NDC needs to work hard. As for the MPP, uh, uh, it's, it's a tall order. They first have to start in their own base that are getting increasingly disenchanted, uh, openly either uh, deflecting to the NDC deciding to uh, uh, just uh, uh, stay and not engage in uh, politics. That is a lot of work to do. And if you look at the current posturing of the new patriotic party, where the things it is doing is towards uh, uh, actually entrenching and making their base happy, I would say that is the right way to go. But by the time they finish with their base, and perhaps try to think of the floating voters and uh, loosely leaning national democratic Congress members, John Mahama will be elected. Let, let me just come back into the studio. There are some interesting questions that have been raised about your methodology. Um, you heard them. Yes. Uh, gender, among other things. What are your quick responses to those? Right. When it comes to methodology, we have taken the human interference from the selection process entirely. We, when you say human interference, what do you We use a simulation system to pick the consequences. OK. So the 30% the, the we have allocated runs through the entire constituencies and pick 30% of that region's constituency. Because we don't want to be accused of selectively picking areas. Mm. We don't want to do that. But when we have done that, that's the first step. The second step is that those you have selected, what is the voting population of those constituencies? So the sample for that region is assigned based on the weight of the constituency. So if, for example, Sawasi was the second constituency that had largest voters in the Ashanti region, in the last poll, we can't give them less numbers than, than uh, um, um, let, let me give you, for example, let me give you precise numbers. In the last poll, this very poll, we had 14 constituencies. We have uh, Mansun Kwanta, Offensive North, Sachira Franklin's, Asante Achim Central, Asante Achim North, Achimo Ubeja South, Offensive South, Asante Achim South, Asawasi, and so on and so forth. The highest, uh, the population with the highest, uh, the constituency with the highest population was Achimo Ubeja South. It had 101 samples. So Asawasi was the largest, 116. Among these constituencies, they have the highest voters. You cannot do any sampling than using the voting weight of that constituency relative to uh, what you have picked. Followed by Achima with Baja Sap, 11, 101. The least was uh, Afram Plains, uh, which, is 20, which is 21 or thereabouts. So it is weighted at every step in the process. We, we, because we don't, we don't want to be accused, why do you pick here? So it's entirely randomized using computer. Okay. Then in terms of agenda, look, we refine our way as we go along. You go in the... Uh, let, me, let, let me just quickly do this. Um, we have uh, Sami Jemfi, National Communications, officer of the NDC. Let me just acknowledge him. Sami Jemfi, good morning. Good morning, Ben. Sami, just give me a minute. I want uh, Musa Dankwa to lay a foundation on a point he's making, and I'll come to you. That's okay. Right. On, on the agenda, it may, be, it, it may not be the conventional thing they do, but in the field, when we go there, people tell me, I'm not a female, I'm not a male. They tell you openly. Oh, I yes. see. Yes, how do you classify them? They're not male. They're not so that, those fall into the that, that, other That category. call for us to create that, that, that column, because look, we can tell you which, where, which part of the country has this group of people. Before then, nobody knows. Mm. We are picking this data, and it's relevant. We can analyze with time how they're even voting. Because you don't call people who are not male or female, male. Okay, so now, now I'm getting, and that's why we have to come to you. It gives yes. a better understanding of yes. it. Yes. When I come back to you later, I would also want to look at, because it points to a certain gap between the MPP and the NDC in terms of the voting pattern. I'll come to you on that later. And then we'll also look at the stratification in terms of the direction of the country and the age group delineations and how people, what people's reflections are. But Sami Jemfi, uh, thank you for staying with us. Have you seen the survey? Yes, I've, I've seen the survey. I've not read it in good detail, but at least I've gone through the executive summary and I've glanced through the various slides. Yeah. The survey reveals that 65% um, 
of Ghanaians uh, feel voters, I, I should say, believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. 62% disapprove of President Akufuado's performance. 52% of these voters believe the government has performed very poorly. What are your reactions? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a very good morning to your viewers and listeners. Good morning to my senior brother, uh, Mr. Musa Damkwan. And let me commend him and his organization, Global Info Analytics, for their consistency in conducting and publishing these kinds of uh, scientific surveys, uh, which have been lacking in our political space. I, I must just um, add, though, past. that, I mean, if the data hadn't supported your end, I don't know how you would be reacting. Oh, not Whether at you'd all. still be not congratulating Musa sure the work they have done <laughs> uh, have, I mean, been supportive of the NDC mm. uh, position. But we must encourage uh, um, um, such, you know, intellectual exercises in our democracy. Uh, it takes a lot of resources to engage in this kind of intellectual, scientific, you know, exercise. And I am impressed with the consistency. It's not been a, a one-off thing. They've been very consistent. They do it on a quarterly basis. And for us as a political party, whether the outcome is positive or negative for us, whether we disagree or agree uh, is not the issue. We go through and we, we, we make useful uh, lessons for our strategy and for the battle ahead of us, which is the 2024 general election. So kudos to uh, Global Info Analytics. Uh, on the specific question you asked about the percentage of voters, 65% of voters who think that Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, I, 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 I think that that is not surprising at all. Because Ghanaians have become increasingly uh, conscious of the misgovernance of this country, the destruction of this country by the incumbent MPP administration. And they are living witnesses of the destruction of the country, particularly the destruction of the economy under the watch of this Kufuado Baumia MPP government. They live it. Like Bob Marley said, he who, you know, feels it, knows it best. And they feel the hardships. They feel the, the, the deterioration of the economy on the daily basis when they go to the market, when they have to fend for their families. You know, everything is in disarray. And when you travel across the country like we politicians do, you get that feedback from the people. And so I'm not surprised at all that this study is showing that 65% of Ghanaians think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. I think that it is even an understatement and that the numbers could be higher than that. Because today, today, my brother, whether it's the price of fuel, whether it's the price of basic food commodities, building materials, clothing, the basic necessities of life, go check the rate of inflation. So high that majority of Ghanaians are not able to cope because they have not seen any improvement in their disposable incomes, and for that matter, their purchasing power. Yet prices continue to rise. The public debt situation is the worst we have seen in the history of this country. Lending rates are so high today, still about 35%, the highest in Africa. The dollar, <laughs> I mean, keeps appreciating against uh, are sinking national currency, the Ghana city. Today you need more than 13 CDC papers to buy a dollar. And this is having a debilitating impact on the capital and profit margins of businesses. So what do you expect? <laughs> you, you, you clearly must expect a vote of no confidence from the electorate, irrespective of your political affiliations, because you are feeling it. The, the, all businessmen, whether they are NTT or NDT or CTT, are feeling the high dollar rate. They are feeling the negative impact of the high cost of fuel, the high, high lending rate, the unprecedented unemployment rate of 14.7%, the debt crisis we have on our hands, you see, and so on and so forth. So I'm not surprised at all that, uh, I, I, I mean, 
55% of voters, according to this poll, are saying that the country is headed in the wrong direction. Again, um, going through the executive summary, uh, I found what well, I found I find interesting rather has to do with the percentage of voters in the western region, a swing region, who think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. I mean, that should tell any objective Ghanaian that the, the people at the helm of affairs of our country today are gone. It. In fact, they are gone. If only 82% of people in the voter region, the stronghold of the NDC, think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. However, 86% of voters in the western region, which was won by the NDP in the 2020 election, 86% of voters in that region today think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. Then they are gone. Gone. Nothing can save them. Sami Jemfi, um, uh, so, some people have said that this election is yours to lose. Uh, I have spoken to some analysts who say it is yours to lose, not the MPPs to win. But on that point, let me come to Musa Dankwa briefly, and then I'll come back to you, Sami Jemfi, before I go to Dr. Ayamga. What, what essentially, when you look at the regional breakdown, tell us what the pattern is for the regional breakdown, especially in crucial, we, we may not look at all of them, but the greater Accra region. In terms of the, who they want to vote for? Or who? Yes, the, the Great Accra region, the Ashanti region, the Central region, the Eastern region, the Volta region, and maybe you can put the Northern Belt together. I mean, that report is going to come on Monday, so I don't want to preempt that on this show today. But generally, give us, I give mean, us a sneak. Um, um, what I can say is that um, <sighs> MPP is leading an Ashanti region, not by great. That is, that is curious because it, this is the yes. purported World Bank. I mean, once they start slipping, some have said that once the NDC gets 30% plus of votes, it's, it's over, game over for the MPP. In Ashanti region, it doesn't look great. If the numbers that we are seeing, even if they do plus five on top of that, that will spell doom for them in the region. It's quite bad. Even in the Ashanti region? Yes. Eastern region is also I mean, equally bad. Uh, they are doing below 50 percent at the moment in in, in eastern place the objective was that is it possible for us to have all these cases resolved before the 7th of january so by the time a president sits in is a sworn in he has a full complement of people to work with and then we can move forward in in if we want to resolve the case within two months that is up to the end of january is it possible to shift the election to November so that we have those two months to deal with these things? Then by the 7th of January, the president is, is, is sworn in, mm. parliament is sworn in, and we have the full complement of people to work with. But we notice that bringing this issue now, because EC took it uh, to IPAC, it was shut down, we don't want to create any problem, and we don't have time to go into that debate. Mm. But we agree that this is necessary. So that after this election, from next year, proposals on these things will start. And we all agreed that all proposals on election reform should start early. Nothing should wait till the last year when people become too suspicious. You are changing the rules because of this or because of that. So early next year, that proposal will come up. Okay. So that by 2028, election will be moved early, maybe to November, so that we can... Uh, have all these issues resolved before the 7th of December. So these were the six key issues that we, we discussed mm. and came to some, uh, some conclusions on. So we right. left it over with the judiciary. And uh, we had very good representation at the meeting. Uh, five justices of the Supreme Court were there. The political parties were highly represented with their legal uh, participants, right. a very good, very healthy discussion. And so we believe that going forward, uh, we should be able to have these issues resolved. Okay. And I want to say good job on um, getting the NDC to return back to IPAC. I think since their return, they've attended about two meetings already. How challenging was that? It took you three years. Well, it was not an easy thing. You know, after the last election, there were all kinds of uh, issues, uh, accusations, counter-accusations, suspicion, and all of that. And so it took a, quite a while. The process began with the old administration of the NDC and MPP, uh, Fusuan Kofu, mm. Stephen Ketia, Freddy Blay, uh, and others. We, we, we began the discussion. We had to take them to a hotel somewhere uh, to talk. Yeah. Uh, they agreed on certain things. 
We wanted to bring the EC in. It was difficult getting them in. We went forward and backwards. Uh, we had to go back door to talk to President Mahama at a certain point. You know, a lot of background work was done. Mm. And then until we finally got to a point where we were able to get the NDC back. Right. So now, does the NPC have a database or conflict zones or a comprehensive mapping or map out of conflict hotspots so you can preempt what um, conflicts this election? Yes, we okay. do have that. We did that with the University of Cape Coast. So we have all the hotspots in the country mapped up. But then we keep reviewing these things because mm. uh, conflict is quite fluid. And right. sometimes something small sparks up somewhere and then suddenly the whole country is in trouble. So we keep reviewing some of these things. And then at certain points, we realize that some of the interventions that we put in minimizes some conflicts in some areas. Then other areas also are heightened. So we keep monitoring these things and uh, we have an eye on all of those things. And we've challenged all the regional peace councils also to monitor these areas carefully. And a lot of work is going on in, in most of those places. What does this work look like? <laughs> we, we set up peace ambassadors who are yeah. constantly working in there. We do training on violent extremism within those places. Between, we've had training for queen mothers. We have youth. We are currently in secondary schools. We've done training for tertiary institution leaders. Uh, we get into all those communities, and right. then we keep, we keep working in, in those places. OK. Recently, the flag bearer of, or the leader of the Movements for Change made some comments, and he'd received a lot of backlash that it was instigating violence. He said that um, Christians should vote for a Christian leader. We've seen most of the other parties come out to say that that's a, a statement that was flawed. We haven't seen anything yet from the NPC. How do you react to a statement like that? Well, I think on the 15th of November last year, mm. the NPC issued a press release in, uh, in partnership with the Christian Council of Ghana, the Catholic Bishops Conference, the Office of the National Peace Imam. And in fact, later on, the uh, Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council even wanted to join in that, that statement, where we told the public that let's avoid religion in politics. The fact is that for anybody who has done peace studies, religion, tribe, uh, ethnicity are major issues in conflict. Once it sparks, these are things that touches the life of people, and therefore they react violently to some of these things. And so we've been cautioning the public and all the political players, let us avoid going into that space. Now, when we did it initially, the tension came down, especially immediately after the MPP elected this flag bearer. Mm. That issue came up strongly and all over social media. So we had to provide an intervention immediately. It stopped. Now we are seeing pockets of it coming again. So we want to remind the public that we have already issued a, a press release cautioning the whole public, let's avoid it, uh, uh, religion coming into our politics. We have lived as one people. I went to school initially with Muslims, friends. I used to tell my police on the Peace Council, I used to live in Asafu, very close to the Media Mosque. My landlord, my mother's landlord at the time was a Muslim. We lived in that house. We played with the kids. Sometimes after we played football, we went to the mosque. I didn't know what they were doing, but I went there with them. When they bow, I bow. When they get up, I get up. We, we were friends. We lived together up to this point. Why are we now creating this conflict among ourselves? Mm. We've had schoolmates, we have classmates, we have workmates. We want to live together. So why are we suddenly bringing this thing into our country that can create division? So we want to appeal to all the players. Let us stay focused. What do you want to do for this country? What can you do best? For which reason you are asking people to vote for you? And let's put religion and ethnicity on the side. It will not help anybody. Well, it's not uncommon that some of these political leaders, party leaders, flag bearers, will still flaunt these directions and appeal that you're um, appealing to them. Should that happen, what punishments could be meted out to them? Are there any repercussions well, for going contrary to these directives? The, the mandate of the National Peace Council does mm. not make room for us to uh, 
without any punishment to anybody right. or any sanction. Mm. Right. But as part of the work we've done with the parties, we had political party code of conduct. Uh, but a month ago, when we met with the parties, they agreed that we set up a committee to monitor those things. So we are in the process of putting that committee together. At our next meeting, we'll present the names to them for their approval so that they themselves will call out their own people and tell them that what you're saying is not right. We shouldn't go this way. We shouldn't go that way. We think that if they police themselves, it will be better for us than for us to go back and say, I condemn this and I condemn that. Mm. For us, because we are mediators, we try to avoid condemnation because when issues come up, it will still come back to us to resolve. So we don't want to take a position where it, it gives an impression as if you are biased when you are adjudicating uh, or trying to mediate between uh, issues. So those are the reasons why we have avoided condemning and all of those things. But, they, but again, we must make clear that we don't have the mandate to do that. And so we don't tread into those things. But we are working with Fact Check Ghana now, uh, trying to ensure that when people make statements, sometimes the headlines may be different from exactly what the person said. So we send the information immediately to Fact Check. Fact Check looks at it, gives us a feedback, and then we know that this information is credible. Can we act on it? Sometimes we call the people to our office, we sit down with them and say, look, we are gentlemen, you're all normal people, you want to rule this country, let's not go on this path. Sometimes some of them, by the time they get to the office, they start apologizing. We said this, uh, we didn't mean it, and then all of those things. But we keep mm. cautioning them that, look, let us maintain the peace and stability of our country. It's the most important thing for us to do now. The National Peace Council has come under scrutiny, not scrutiny per se, individuals like Sam George have... Uh, have some bad things to say about your stance on this anti-LGBTQ plus bill. Again, like you said again this morning, you are a mediator, so you do not want to take a stance. But this bill or this conversation has become very crucial because a lot of people have differing opinions on the way that the government or the country should go. How do you respond to those who are criticizing your stance on this? Let's look at a very critical situation. Hmm. Because of this bill, there's a conflict between the speaker and the president. Mm. Which institution in this country can resolve this, apart from the Peace Council? <laughs> so well, if the Peace Council mandate, has taken so... the position... <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we need to think about it. If the Peace Council has taken a position, will we have the right to even attempt to mediate? People are calling on us. Why is the Peace Council quiet? Can't you people help to mediate in this matter and all of those? All those discussions are going on. So the council does not take a position. When there is a major conflict, we are the only people people can call upon. Right now, is the speaker ready to back up and say that I have withdrawn? Is the president ready to back up? Somebody must come in between. And people are appealing to the Peace Council. Why don't you step into this matter and help resolve this thing? So the public must understand the role of the Peace Council. We just don't get into anything. We sit back. And initially, when I gave that interview on TV3, I said that we don't take a position. If there's a conflict, and someone said, but there's a conflict, I said, we haven't gotten to that point yet. But look at where we are now. You need an institution to step in. And the Peace Council is the only institution that can do this work now. So the public must understand our role. When we say that we don't take a position, it doesn't that mean that individuals don't say it. I said it on, on doing that interview. Mm. Everybody on the council, I represent the Christian council. Christian council has spoken. The office of the chief imam has spoken. Traditional rulers have spoken. Mm. The council of Christ, everybody has spoken. So why are you forcing the Christian council to make a statement? <laughs> and the council is made up of representatives of these institutions. But what we've said is that our institutions can say whatever they want to say. Mm. But for the peace council, we need to remain neutral so that whenever the conflict gets to a certain point, that means we can step in and deal with the matter. So I think it's important that the, the public understands our mandate. Ours is not to condemn, ours is not to align. We stay in the middle and do the best we can to resolve whatever impasse we have. Right. 
So now there's uh, reports, there have been news about arms and even conflicts tripping down into Ghana from our neighboring uh, countries like Burkina Faso and, and the rest. I'd like to know what your assessment of that situation is and how you're working to ensure that we still, maintain, we still enjoy the peace that we are enjoying in this country currently and not the influx of these wars on our bordering countries don't you know, upset the peace we are enjoying. It's, it's a major threat to our country, and especially for us, uh, because we are not into the issue of arms and all of that. That's the responsibility of the, the Small Arms Commission. Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, the chair of the Small Arms Commission is also a member of the Peace Council. So once we are doing these discussions, he knows where we're going. Right. You know, so we leave that with Small Arms to handle. Ours is to ensure that we continue to provide education on violent extremism so that we don't get into a situation where everybody starts shooting somebody because of some, something very trivial. So that is what we've been doing and providing training. Most of our uh, regional peace councils in the border towns are actively working in those areas. Mm. Uh, getting to the Bono areas, getting to Cote d'Ivoire, the northern part of the country and all yeah. of those. A lot of work is going on. There's very active work going on in all the five northern regions. Uh, with a lot of support from USAID and several other institutions dealing with the issue of violent extremism and how we can tone these things down. Mm. So for Peace Council, ours, ours is to talk to people to help them to understand that we may disagree, but it does not necessarily mean we have to fight. We may disagree, we, we don't have to pull a gun and, and pull a, a machete and kill somebody. So those are the things we keep telling our public. Let us talk, let us resolve our problems and let us not go on that route. Now, once we don't deal with the violent extremism, it also emboldens these extremists who are outside our country to come in. And those are the, the things that we keep cautioning our people. Mm -hmm. Extremists are looking for opportunities to step into a given situation. So when we create the unnecessary tension and the violence, it gives them the opportunity to move in. And right now, the number of arms in this country is frightening. Mm. And we, may, especially within the northern part of our country, and uh, it's now in, in the past people were looking at having a motorbike as a prestige in some of those places. Now the prestige is I must have a, a gun, and how sophisticated my gun is shows where my position is. And these are things that we uh, we are uh, talking with our partners in terms of this this way uh, to do the best we can. We've talked, spoken to the police. We've spoken to. Uh, the other security agencies monitor these things. Let's help to bring it down as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also think that the media must help us in terms of public education in this area so that we can reduce the tension as much as possible. Thank you so much, Reverend. But we cannot let you go. I cannot let you go without your message of peace to the good people of this country, especially this year, come December. What would that be? We want to appeal to all Ghanaians. Uh, Election is competition, and for every competition, people will agitate and do a matter of things. But let us remember that in the midst of all the things we are doing, we have only one country to live in. And therefore, in the midst of our competition, let's be careful of what we say, how we say it, so that we can maintain the peace, the stability, the security of our country. It's in the midst of peace that businesses can run. It's in the midst of peace our schools can run. It's in the midst of peace that everybody can go about his or her normal duties peacefully. So let us do the best we can to maintain the peace of our country. Thank you so much. Reverend Dr. Enes Edujemfi is chairman of the National Peace Council. It was a pleasure chatting with you this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay. Right, so there you have it, but there's still more to come. Right now, Benjamin is coming to do some analysis on data from Global Info Analytics on what people are saying they will do come election 2024. Stay for that conversation. <laughs> Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to get into what the political crystal ball 
uh, is revealing. And we're going to conduct an analysis on a research, a survey put together by Global Info Analytics. They've been doing this for quite a while. And per the latest statistics that we're getting, they believe 65% uh, of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction compared to 25% who believe it is actually headed in the right uh, direction. There are many other dynamics uh, to look at, but the man himself behind the outfit, Musa Dankwa, is in uh, the studio and he's joining me for a conversation. Musa, good morning. Good morning to you. I hope you're well. Doing very well, thank you. All right. So here we are, the latest survey from April the 4th, 4th April 2024. So the fourth day of the fourth month. Just walk us through what exactly the basics are of this. Um, as we normally do, uh, we went around the country mm. uh, every 90 days. Uh, we spoke to 6,128 uh, voters across all the 16 regions and from 82 constituencies uh, randomly on the street. And this is one of the things we do you know, to be able to understand very well what's going to happen in December 2024. So this is the start of the question. This is the question one we ask voters. Okay. Uh, the first question, in your view, do you believe that Ghana is heading in the right direction or wrong direction? We believe that it's a very important question because it tends to correlate with how they intend to vote in the end and many other factors. So this is one of the important questions we ask. Uh, and we've been tracking this question for the past in fact, uh, since January 2022. So every time we go and we track it. So we have a tracking poll showing where we were as a country way back in 2002, uh, 2022, and now. You can see the trend line for such questions. I see. So you, you talk about some of these latest dynamics. You say 65% of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. 62% disapprove of President Okufuado's performance, and 52% of voters believe the government has performed very poorly. But let me, let me, let me ask this. Um, what is the sample size? How many people were you interacting with? Where were you interacting with them? Um, we interviewed um, 6,128 voters from 82 constituencies. 6,000 how many? 128. 6,128, right. No, you can go ahead. From all the 16 regions and across 82 constituencies. Okay. And uh, predominantly, so when you say 82 constituencies, what was the spread? Is it even per, because the no, voter populations are different. It's not Some even, are higher and it's all not of even. that. So. In fact, um, the samples are deployed 20% in Greater Accra because most voters are in Greater Accra in that mm. proportion. 18% mm. were deployed in Ashanti region. 10% were deployed in the Eastern Region, 9% for Central Region, 7% for Western Region, 6 for Northern Region, Volta 6%, Bono 4%, Upper East 4%, Bono East 4%, Upper West 3%, Western North 2%, OT 2%, Savannah 2%, North East 2%, and Ahavo 2%. So it is uh, uh, proportional to the number of voters who live in those uh, regions. I see. Um, we'll look at the regional breakdowns and all of that, but essentially, what, what are the major bits that we should be looking at based on the survey? You've mentioned some of them, 6,128 sampled, 16 regions, 82 constituencies, and of course, you used a weighted uh, uh, system uh, in there. In terms of your methodology, uh, you, you have a confidence level of 99%, a margin of error of 1.66%. Uh, uh, you also say the Electoral Commission's 2023 voters register was used as your sample frame and that 30% of constituencies from each region um, was randomly selected and allocated the regional quota based on total voters in each of the selected constituencies. Does that mean you find this to be a watertight very, survey? Very, very. But you know you could easily get it wrong. Polls get it wrong all the time. No, within the margin of error. You see, um, the way you structure the question also counts. Mm. Which question do you ask first? Also. Are they leading questions? Are no, they... Exactly. Okay. And also, even how you arrange the questions. For example, we have a question which asks about their political affiliation. 
But that question comes at the very end of the survey. Because we believe that when you ask that question from the beginning, people will begin to behave MPP, behave NDC. Mm. So they didn't expect us to ask them that question. But that is the last question we ask you. And at that point, you have no chance to go back and alter your answers. I see. In the weighting system, 6% uh, given to the Volta region, 18% to the Ashanti region, 20% to the Great Accra region. And you've given us some um, you know, delineations of why. But when it comes to gender, mm. what picture do we see? The gender, uh, we normally rely, try to balance the gender in the field, physically. Mm. Um, it's around 49% women and 51 male along, along the, uh, the, the population, generally. Why, why do you use that, though? Because no, no. in terms of the, the real population... No, there are more men now than women, according to the new census. Oh. Yes, it's changed. Really? It's, it's flipped. More men now than yeah, women? Yeah, 51% men and roughly 49 Oh, I get, I get what you mean. Yeah. It was slightly, yeah, slightly. it's borderline. Yeah. right? So what we do is that in the field, we try to balance the quota in the field by sampling women and make sure that we are reached within that range. But sometimes, in certain areas, you don't get a male at a certain point in time. And at a certain point in time, you find only female. So we're mm. trying to balance it. Like, okay, in the morning, we try and get the, the woman. In the evening, you get the male. But you're not always going to be perfectly right. But we believe that in elections in this country, it's not gender-based. Rather, political party affiliation is more important than the, gender, than the gender of voters. I see. And I'm seeing something here that says 46% uh, that is the female and 54% male. Yeah. Other groupings are also in there. But in terms of education, mm -hmm. the, the people you're speaking to, what, what caliber of people are you speaking to? What is their educational background? It's a mix. It's also important in studies yes, like yes, this. Yes. Senior high were 38% of the respondents. Mm. And then junior high was 17%. 18% mm. uh, had no formal education. And then tertiary, 26%. Do you know why this is interesting? Because of free SHS. Yes. The number in there, in fact, that's the highest. Yes. If you add the number for junior high to the number for no education, it's, it's just around what you would get. In fact, 35%. It's even less than what you would get for the, the senior high bracket, those in senior high school. But, but, but what, what was the, those from the senior high schools? Can you tell us briefly where they were leaning towards in, in terms of these questions? What were the answers like? Um, if you look at the uh, question about the direction of the country, everybody, every demography, is saying that we're heading the wrong way. Even those benefiting from yes. free SHS? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. So it's a cross-board feeling. And in fact, every region says, not in the right path. Then right before we get into the regions and what they say, in terms of work, and I'm just letting us break down, so from gender to schooling, education to work, Retired, 2%, other 4%, those who didn't answer, 7%, government or NGO, 11%, casual workers, 12%, unemployed, 12%, private companies, 14%, students, 15%, 15% self-employed, 46%. And when you take a look at religion, uh, traditional religion, 3%, others, 2%, non-religious, 5%, Islam, 20%, Christianity, 70%. I'm interested in this because... Some people like to play the religious card. You, you heard recently Alan Chabating mm. say that we need a Christian uh, leader. The vice president, some have uh, flayed him because some say he is Christian at some point and Muslim at some point, but he is Muslim. We know that. How relevant is this statistic, religion and, and the, the voting pattern? Um, I would say it is relevant in the context of the Christians. Mm because the poll shows that Muslims are less influenced by the religion of the candidates. Oh, really? Yes. Religion doesn't really matter to them. To the Muslims. Christian or Muslim? No, the, the Muslims. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, 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 doesn't it doesn't matter, matter to them who, whether the person is Christian or Muslim. No, they don't really matter. It doesn't matter to them. I see. It's the Christian that some of them have uh, the feeling that we must be led by our own. And I think at the moment, about 16% of voters said religion will matter to them in 2024 elections down from 24%, which is an improvement from the last poll. Mm. And when I look at the religious stratification, even among Christians, Pentecostals that you spoke to accounted for 20%, Charismatic 17%, Presbyterian 17%, Catholic 15%, and it goes on and on, Anglican 6% and all. But let's get to, and, and with the Muslims, the Islamic sects, Sunni 59%, 
Ahmadiyya 16%, Tijaniya 12%, other 7%, Shia 6%. Uh, and then the ethnic groups, it's interesting because you spoke to a lot more Akans. Because that's what... That's, Way more. No. In, 46, no, I, I, I mean, I'm not criticizing you, but that is, I guess, the, the statistic. Yes. Akan, 46%. Yes. Others, 13%. Ever. 11%. Gadangwe, 11%. Mole Dagbani, 10%. Guan, 6%. Grushi, 2%. Gurma, 1%. And Mande, 1%. But why, why this, though? No, it reflects the current mm. structure of our ethnic groups in Ghana. If you look okay. at numbers, these numbers are consistent with it. Mm. It means that if you are doing random sampling truly on the street, the, the, what you find in, in, on the street will be what GSS has on their system. I can't start roughly around 40% of the population. And then in terms of the party affiliations, right before I go to Dr. Michael Ayamga, uh, the 90-day moving average together with uh, the first time voters, what's, what's the pattern? What does it reveal from no, there? They, we have seen a, a, a decline in the number of people who openly say they are MPP. Openly. A decline in the people who openly say they are MPP. Profess they are yes. members of the MPP. Yes, yes. And we've seen that of NDC stating study, or in some cases going up. And then also we've seen a, 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 an increase in those who refuse to declare their party affiliation. And that number moves in the opposite direction with MPP. When MPP goes down, that number goes up. I see. And then in terms of first-time voters, we've seen the uh, majority of them either seeing their MPP or floating voters, sorry, NDC or floating voters than MPP. In the current poll, among first-time voters, um, about 25% of them said they are NDC. Mm -hmm. 26 are floating voters. 23 did not disclose their party affiliation, and MPP is 22%. So they are not openly... So it's a three percentage gap between the NDC and yeah. the MPP. Yes. The NDC in the lead there, but the real concern is the floating voters, yes. 26%. Yeah, they are going up, yes. Because if you add even, what, 20% to any of these parties, they are, they are almost home, home free. Yeah. Okay. Let me bring in Dr. Michael Ayamga. Uh, Doc, good morning. Thank you for joining the conversation. Hello, Dr. Ayamga. You may have to unmute if it's not already. I think I'm on. Okay, I'm muted. I can hear you now, Doc. Um, okay. I, I want to believe you've seen the recent poll by Global Info Analytics. Um, Mr. Musa Dankwa is here in the studio with us. It evinces that 65% of voters believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, 62% disapprove of President Ekufuado's performance, and 52% believe the government has performed very poorly. Uh, would you give credence to looking at the times and the research patterns from Global Info Analytics? What would be your reading of what, what they are showing? It, it appears things are getting even worse. Yeah, I would uh, like to characterize this survey as something that is a barometer, just gives an indication of uh, how people are feeling at this time, rather than it being a reflection of the percentages. The percentages I think uh, are way, 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 way worse than they are for the president and for the MPP. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, data is no uh, less an indication that uh, the country is not going in the right direction. Uh, I am particularly uh, concerned with a few things in the methodology, just a couple of things. So you can quickly walk yeah. us through that? Yes. Very quickly, uh, very first, quickly. Yes. First of all, <laughs> one of the challenges I have with is they are taking 30% of constituencies in uh, the region, and then you realize that they are very uh, partisan uh, constituencies. For example, if you take per thirty percent of Asante region and then you add Asawasi inside there, what you are doing is actually overestimating the NDC's uh, strength in there because you more or less be talking about an extreme value uh, for the NDC in that context, and then a central or a, a medium value for uh, the new patriotic party. Uh, that matter. So, uh, I feel that so, so in other words, that, in that in that instance, yes. it would favor the NDC. The NDC, yes, yes. So that is the the, the, the reality 
I'm seeing here. I would have wished that they try to make uh, the proportion or the the, the, the weight of uh, Asawasi in the whole uh, FOTA population that Central Region reflect rather than uh, just putting it in uh, there. And I think it also speaks volumes for uh, uh, the same for uh, other uh, uh, MPP in the Volta region and the rest. So you may say there may be a counseling out effect there, but uh, going forward, I wish to see uh, uh, these constituencies that tend to be outliers uh, uh, well managed so that they don't end up uh, uh, giving some false hope to some people or making some people feel unnecessarily depressed. I also see something that worries me, and that is the gender. Uh, I have seen that we have moved away from the non -bi the binary characterization of gender to include other. And when I saw that, I was beginning to question uh, the rationale for that and uh, why we felt the need to <coughs> add another to our uh, uh, research. I'm not in any way trying to talk about the rights issues here. I'm just talking about the professional practices that we have engaged in over the years. And if you even look, go to, you see that uh, in some of them, you have none people entering them. Uh, in, on page nine that I am in there, you can see that for Bono, you have two people entering. And throughout, you see uh, uh, people entering uh, other. And I'm asking why the need for that. If you now go way, 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 way back to the point where we are talking about the uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, issues, you realize that uh, it seems to tie into why uh, this uh, data, and that uh, worries me. Uh, I, I feel extremely uh, uh, sad when I see statistics being played with, because it's my passion, I love it, and uh, we should always uh, uh, try to, to, to keep things the way they are. You go to the Upper West region, the most conservative... And maybe, maybe, can, may, maybe we can make that the final point, because we have to get into yeah, the main that, statistics. That's what I'm saying. If you look at that, then you go to the Upper West region, which I say is the most conservative region in Ghana. There are other Catholics or Muslims, largely. And uh, if you see the relative uh, 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 indifference to the issue of LGBTQ, uh, it, it worries me. And I think that that, 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 that portion of the study uh, raises uh, red flags. And uh, I don't know why uh, that has been the case, especially moving to a non-binary categorization of uh, in our research. I don't know when that starts. So, so I will, I will leave Musa Dankwa when I get to him to answer those uh, questions. But generally, when you look at the figures, like I mentioned, you say that they could even be higher than, I mean, the 65% of voters believing Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, 62% uh, disapproving of President Okufuado's performance, and 52% believing the government had performed very badly. Since you are into... Uh, the core research. When you look at the distribution of MPP voters, for example, you have 2% from the Ahafu region, 23% um, from the Ashanti region, and which are the others? Central region, 12%, Eastern region, 15%. These are crucial regions I am mentioning. Uh, the Greater Accra region, 18%. Uh, percent. And then the distribution of NDC voters, uh, you have the Ahafu region, 1%, uh, 10% in the Ashanti region. Let's go to their stronghold, uh, the Volta region, 10%, then Greater Accra region, 26%. What picture does that paint for you in terms of the distribution of voters from either of the political parties? Yes, and I think uh, uh, Musa pointed one important uh, indicator to see people who are moving increasingly away from the MPP, uh, benefiting the NDC or becoming undecided. Uh, it's a position no polit politician wants to be in. At, at a point where you already have very serious problems with your own core base, it means that you have a lot of homework to do before you even start pursuing floating voters and then those that uh, vote in other areas. So I would say that uh, it is a big challenge, but it reflects the trend in the country that uh, the MPP is no longer an attractive brand for these elections. Uh, you have people walk around and they want to dissociate themselves uh, from the MPP because of what they are going to. Uh, one of the easiest ways you can observe that is to normally look at the sheds and other things. You increasingly see uh, people now are not wanting to go and sit under this 
uh, shares and all those things. Uh, so uh, it's a key challenge and a big issue for uh, the MPP as far as uh, this election uh, is concerned. Everything is uh, uh, pointing to a, a very significant defeat for the MPP if these numbers pull. If nothing dramatic happens to change uh, the, the things in this country and the livelihoods of people, which I doubt will happen. I told you the other time, we could well be uh, uh, asking Mohammed who is going to be in this government when we meet him next time. You say a significant uh, defeat, and um, I do not know, I mean, technically what that would, that would signal, but uh, later I'll get to Musa Dankwa on that because he was mentioning some figures. When you look at the floating voters, right before I come back to Musa Dankwa and, and get some responses, you would see something interesting. When you look at the Greater Accra region, where the largest density of votes comes, even before the Ashanti region, uh, the floating voters are as high as 22% from this survey. Then you have 13% from the Ashanti region. In the Eastern region, 10%. In the Volta region, 6%. And in the Eastern region, like I mentioned earlier, 10%. How, how much of a role, per this analysis, how much of a role do you feel floating voters will pay, uh, play in the election? Especially if you pay attention to the fact that before, when it spoke about the voting patterns and those aligned to parties, I think 22% for the MPP, 25% uh, for the NDC, and 26% floating voters. How crucial, per this survey and generally, do you feel floating voters will be come election 2024? Yes, yeah, the issue is they are going to be the decider in the elections. Uh, you can look at uh, the scenario where they are more predisposed to uh, not going to vote at all. That is uh, the danger uh, in here, and that should be bad news for the MPP if uh, these people decide not to go and vote. Mm. Uh, the other thing, uh, the NDC has a lot of work to do to uh, attract these uh, people. Uh, the base of the, uh, the National Democratic Congress is charged. Uh, uh, they are bearing the brunt of uh, the uh, non-inclusive growth and development that we are currently experiencing in the country. So if you talk of the poor NDC people, you can forget of that. They are going to stick with their candidate. The other issue is whether the party is structuring itself uh, well enough to attract these floating voters who mostly, uh, I can say, feel unwelcome with a highly partisan nature of things currently uh, going on. Uh, uh, we are hung around some here in the US. There are a lot of people who are undecided. But we don't think uh, the NDC is welcoming enough. Uh, they can belong there. And I think that it is a lot of work for them to do. Uh, they, they are currently very busy uh, uh, working and posting pictures. And, uh, uh, looking like when you are working, you are already in there. And that excludes and dispels uh, uh, these floating voters who want to engage on the uh, issues. When, uh, the NDC needs to work uh, uh, hard to make itself attractive to these people, especially people in the intelligentsia and people up there. They, are, they, are, they mostly would feel that they are not uh, uh, welcome in the NDC. So the NDC needs to work hard. As for the MPP, uh, uh, it's, it's a tall order. They first have to start in their own base that are getting increasingly disenchanted, uh, openly either uh, deflecting to the NDC, deciding to uh, uh, just uh, uh, stay and not engage in uh, politics. That is a lot of work to do. And if you look at the current posturing of the new patriotic party, where the things it is doing is towards uh, uh, actually entrenching and making their base happy. I would say that is the right way to go. But by the time they finish with their base, and perhaps try to think of the floating voters and uh, loosely leaning National Democratic Congress members, Don Mahama will be elected. Let, let me just come back into the studio. There are some interesting questions that have been raised about your methodology. Um, you heard them. Yes. Uh, gender, among other things. What are your quick responses to those? Right. When it comes to methodology, we have taken the human interference from the selection process entirely. We, when you say human interference, what do you We use a simulation system to pick the consequences. Okay. So the 30% the, the we have allocated 
runs through the entire constituencies and pick 30% of that region's constituency. Because we don't want to be accused of selectively picking areas. Mm. We don't want to do that. But when we have done that, that's the first step. The second step is that those you have selected, what is the voting population of those constituencies? So the sample for that region is assigned based on the weight of the constituency. So if, for example, Sawasi was the second constituency that had largest voters in the Ashanti region, in the last poll, we can't give them less numbers than, than uh, um, um, let, let me give you, for example, let me give you precise numbers. In the last poll, this very poll, we had 14 constituencies. We have uh, Mansung Kwanta, Offensu North, Sechira Fram Plains, Asante Achim Central, Asante Achim North, Achimo Ubeja South, Offensu South, As Asante Achim South, Asawasi, and so on and so forth. The highest, uh, the population with the highest, uh, the constituency with the highest population was Achimo Ubeja South. It had 101 samples. So Asawasi was the largest, 116. But among these constituencies, they have the highest voters. You cannot do any sampling than using the voting weight of that constituency relative to uh, what you have picked. Followed by Achima would be just up, 11, 101. The list was uh, Afram Plains, uh, which, is 20, which is 21 or thereabouts. So it is weighted at every step in the process. We, we, because we don't, we don't want to be accused, why did you pick here? So it's entirely randomized using computer. Okay. Then in terms of the gender, look, we refine our way as we go along. You go in there. Uh, let, me, let, let me just quickly do this. Um, we have uh, Sami Jemfi, National Communications Officer of the NDC. Let me just acknowledge him. Sami Jemfi, good morning. Good morning, Ben. Sami, just give me a minute. I want uh, Musa Dankwa to lay a foundation on a point he's making, and I'll come to you. That's okay. All right. On, on the agenda, it may, be, it, it may not be the conventional thing they do, but in the field, when we go there, people say, I'm not a female, I'm not a male. They tell you openly. Oh, I yes. see. How do you classify them? They're not male. They're not so that, those fall into the... That, 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 that call for us to create that, that, that column. Because look, we can tell you which, where, which part of the country has this group of people. Before then, nobody knows. Mm. We are picking this data, and it's relevant. We can analyze with time how they're even voting. Because you don't call people who are not male or female, male. Okay, so now, now I'm getting, and that's why we had to come to you. It gives a better understanding of yes. it. When I come back to you later, I would also want to look at, because it points to a certain gap between the MPP and the NDC in terms of the voting pattern. I'll come to you on that later. And then we'll also look at the stratification in terms of the direction of the country and the age group delineations and how people, what people's reflections are. But Sami Jemfi, uh, thank you for staying with us. Have you seen the survey? Yes, I've, I've seen the survey. I've not read it in good detail, but at least I've gone through the executive summary and I've glanced through the various slides. Yeah. The survey reveals that some um, 65% of Ghanaians uh, feel, voters, I, I should say, believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. 62% disapprove of President Akufuado's performance. 52% of these voters believe the government has performed very poorly. What are your reactions? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a very good morning to your viewers and listeners. Good morning to my senior brother, uh, Mr. Musa Dankwa. And let me commend him and his organization, Global Info Analytics, for their consistency in conducting and publishing these kinds of uh, scientific surveys. Uh, which has been lacking in our political space. I, I must just um, add, though, that, I mean, if the data hadn't supported your end, I don't know how you would be reacting. Oh, no, Whether no, you'd still be no, congratulating no, 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 Musa Dangwa. the work they have done uh, <laughs> has, I mean, been supportive of the NDC uh, mm. position. But we must encourage um, 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 such, you know, intellectual exercises in our democracy. Uh, it takes a lot of resources to engage in this kind of intellectual, scientific, you know, exercise. And I am impressed with the consistency. It's not been a, a one-off thing. They've been very consistent. They do it on a quarterly basis. And for us as a political party, whether the outcome is positive or negative for us, whether we disagree or agree, uh, is not the issue. We go through and we, we, we make useful uh, lessons for our strategies 
and for the battle ahead of us, which is the 2024 general election. So kudos to uh, Global Info Analytics. Uh, on the specific question you asked about the percentage of voters, 65% of voters who think that Ghana is headed in the wrong direction, I, 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 I think that that is not surprising at all because Ghanaians have become increasingly uh, conscious of the misgovernance of this country, the destruction of this country by the incumbent MPP administration. And they are living witnesses of the destruction of the country, particularly the destruction of the economy under the watch of this Kufuado Baumia MPP government. They live it. Like Bob Marley said, he who, you know, feels it, knows it best. And they feel the hardships. They feel the, the, the deterioration of the economy on the daily basis when they go to the market, when they have to fend for their family. You know, everything is in disarray. And when you travel across a country like we politicians do, you get that feedback from the people. And so I'm not surprised at all that this study is showing that 65% of Guineans think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. I think that it is even an understatement and that the number could be higher than that. Because today, today, my brother, whether it's the price of fuel, whether it's the price of basic food commodities, building materials, clothing, the basic necessities of life, go check the rate of inflation. So high that majority of Ghanaians are not able to cope because they have not seen any improvement in their disposable incomes, and for that matter, their purchasing power. Yet prices continue to rise. The public debt situation is the worst we have seen in the history of this country. Lending rates are so high today, still about 35%, the highest in Africa. The dollar, <laughs> I mean, keeps appreciating against uh, are thinking national currency, the Ghana city. Today you need more than 13 CDC pesos to buy a dollar. And this is having a debilitating impact on the capital and profit margins of businesses. So what do you expect? <laughs> you, you, you clearly must expect a vote of no confidence from the electorate, irrespective of your political affiliations, because you are feeling it. The, the, all businessmen, whether they are NTT or NDT or CTT, are feeling the high dollar rate. They are feeling the negative impact of the high cost of fuel, the high lending rate, the unprecedented unemployment rate of 14.7%, the debt crisis we have on our hands, you see, and so on and so forth. So I'm not surprised at all that, uh, I, I, I mean, 65% of voters, according to this poll, are saying that the country is headed in the wrong direction. Again, um, going through the executive summary, uh, I found what I found I find interesting rather has to do with the percentage of voters in the western region, a swing region, who think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. I mean, that should tell any objective Ghanaian that the, the people at the helm of affairs of our country today are gone. In fact, they are gone. If only 82% of people in the voter region, the stronghold of the NDC, think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. However, 86% of voters in the western region, which was won by the NDP in the 2020 election, 86% of voters in that region today think that the country is headed in the wrong direction. Then they are gone. Are gone. Nothing can save them. Sami um, uh, some people have said that this election is yours to lose. Uh, I have spoken to some analysts who say it is yours to lose, not the MPPs to win. But on that point, let me come to Musa Dankwa briefly, and then I'll come back to you, Sami Jemfi, before I go to Dr. Ayamga. What, what essentially, when you look at the regional breakdown, tell us what the pattern is for the regional breakdown, especially in crucial, we, we may not look at all of them, but the greater Accra region. In terms of the, who they want to vote for? Or yes, the, the Greater Accra region, the Ashanti region, the Central region, the Eastern region, the Volta region, and maybe you can put the Northern Belt together. I mean, that report is going to come on Monday, so I don't want to preempt that on this show today. But generally, give us, I give mean, us a snippet. Um, um, what I can say is that um, 
<sighs> MPP is leading in Ashanti region, not by great. Th that, is, that is curious because it, this is the yes. purported World Bank. I mean, once they start slipping, some have said that once the NDC gets 30% plus of votes, it's, it's over. Game over for the In Ashanti region, it doesn't look great. If the numbers that we are seeing, even if they do plus five on top of that, that will spell doom for them in the region. It's quite bad. Even in the Ashanti region? Yes. Eastern region is also I mean, equally bad. Uh, they are doing below 50% at the moment in, in, in Eastern region. Alan, remarkably, is doing well in Eastern now and Ashanti region. And another so so that, that, that's thinking that Alan Tremating is going to cause major problems for Dr. Baumia in these regions. Yes. Traditional powerhouses of the MPP. Yes. It's playing out in the voting pattern. Absolutely. And we've also seen Nanakwam Bediako rearing his head in areas that you shouldn't expect him to do well. Like where? He's doing well in Bunu East, Bunu region, Ashanti region. I'm curious though, just, just on that final bit on that point. The Northern Belt. Mm. You know, it's crucial in this election because both the MPP and the NDC have fielded candidates who are of extraction, you know, northern extraction. How, just give us a general pattern, how is that playing out? It doesn't look what people think is, is it should look like. Uh, if you put the, all the northern regions together, Mama is still leading comfortably. He's in a comfortable lead. Yes. But you know, traditionally, the northern belt of the country, regardless of the new breakdowns, has been more NDC, but over time, time. The MPP has been gained but ground. See, if you look at the data right now, in for the last data, those who are struggling really from standard of living, it's not the region, in the, in the not three northern regions. The economy has hit them very, very hard. And, and that is reflective in what they intend to do. And uh, if you look at the data we have seen, I mean, it's... It's startling, huh? Yeah. So you're saying that Dr. Baumia hailing from the northern belt of the country, Wale Wale, uh, to be specific. In fact, on Monday... It's, well, it's, not going to, it's not really going to help him. If, if you want to see the scale of his problem, look at the behavior of MPP members alone. You leave how NDC guys are behaving, leave the floating guys up how they are behaving, and look at the voting pattern of the current MPP affiliates. It's a clear division in the MPP. They are scattered, they're not united. And that's where the problem is for Baumia. The, the final bit on that. So what do the numbers look like? If you, if you look at the difference, um, likely differences, if, if we were going to the polls today, what would be the we, difference? We, we have looked at the, the models per the current polls that we have. The, 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 the floor numbers, I mean, the current poll number minus the margin of error, and then the current poll number plus margin of error. When you do that, the minimum gap we are seeing right now is about 2.4 million votes. What did you say? 2.4 million votes. 2.4 million votes. Yes. Where, which party is down and which party is up? I mean, uh, MPP is down 2.4 million votes. 2.4 million votes. If, if, if we assume about 18.3 million voters, registered voters, mm -hmm. and say 70% turnout, mm. we're about 2%. So you're using what? 18.3 million, million voters, approximately. Approximately. And then you're assuming 70% turnout. voter turnout. L lower than the last election. And Which then, is lower than the last election, yes, right. Yes, and then about 2% spo spoiled ballots. About 2% of spoiled Ballot. ballots, which is, which is a good statistic, that looking would, at previous elections. Yes. That, that would give you 2.4 million gap right now. That's what Th we're This has about. never happened in, no. in the Fourth Republic. No. I mean, the, the NPP touted 1 million in 2016, no. which was actually about 800,000 mm. votes, and then it fell to about 600,000 less. Uh, 600,000 and below. 2.4 million would be, it, it's almost unimaginable. It is but this is what impact of Alan Chiramatin on the MPP numbers. Wow. Yes. Sami Jemfi, uh, yes, what do you make of this? I mean, if, if this panned out on election day, you would be home dry. But of course, they say never count your eggs until they are hatched. Reactions? Uh, we are not going to be complacent about the deteriorating electoral fortune of our main opponent, because uh, uh, regardless of what the polls say today, they are still a formidable, a formidable um, opposition. 
And Ghana has always been a duopoly um, between the NDC and the NPP. Uh, the strength of these two political parties um, is always, you know, very close. You know, and that is why elections in this country are always very marginal. Are won, you know, always marginal. And so we will not see this at all. Some of the factors um, are not constant. And uh, Musa will tell you that uh, that is why they do this probably uh, on a quarterly basis, I suppose, because certain factors can change along the line. But we pray that things uh, continue to work for the MPP. Uh, deservingly so, because they have failed the people of this country. Um, Wait, did you just say so that you pray, you pray things well, continue to point. worsen for the MPP? Is that what you said? Yeah, I pray things worsen for them, because, and deservingly so, because, I mean, um, um, political parties must face the consequences of their actions. When they lie to their way into power, um, they fail to keep the promises they gave the people on the basis of which they were elected. The people of this country deserve to punish them. And I'm happy that already we are beginning to see that reflected in the post. And it is my prayer that that will continue, that will escalate, and Ghanaians um, will, will, will do justice to the issues on the 7th of December 2024. My disappointment, however, has to do with the percentage of voters who think that corruption is on ascendancy. I think 52% is only inadequate, very small, um, it understates the problem, and it, it shows that maybe we in the opposition need to do more to, um, you know, awaken the consciousness of the electorate about the kind of rot going on, because we all know the reality. Corruption has been the bane of this country in the last seven years because of the alarming and monumental level uh, 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 of corruption that we have seen under the words of the Kufuado and Baulia. Never in the history of this country have we right. seen this wanting rate of the public right. Right. Uh, And so I'm surprised that only 52% said that corruption uh, is on the ascendancy. Um, lastly, lastly uh, it is encouraging, very, very encouraging, that uh, our message uh, calling for our call for the improvement of the free SHS program um, is it gaining traction, and many Ghanaians are beginning to understand it. I'm not sure that that was a situation in 2016, no, in 2020, when we first went into a major election without promise. It is encouraging um, that from this poll, out of the 57% um, 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 of voters, I believe, who said they have benefited directly from free SHS. 57%, barely the same number of voters, agree with the NDC that the free SHS policy has to be reviewed or better still improved. That is very encouraging for us. It shows that uh, our message is being well received because these beneficiaries of the laudable free SHS initiative are living witnesses of the symbolic implementation, which has created... Okay, so, so, so MP, right, so, I mean, know, I, working against I, I think your point, your point is made on that. Let me go to your opposite number. Dr. Ayamga, just hold for me. Sami, hold for me because I'll, I'll have to come back to you. But uh, we also have Richard Ahiagba, Director of Communications with the MPP. Richard, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Benjamin. It's been a while. You don't look for me. Uh, I watch you all the time. Okay, that's, that's reassuring. <laughs> Um, right. Have you seen the latest poll by Global Info Analytics? Um, Benjamin, good morning to you, to Sami, and uh, the other discussions on the line. Hmm. Um, I have not seen the report. I have a copy of it. Right. Um, I've had people discuss it. I have not studied it intentionally because I've taken a position against uh, Global Info Analytics survey. As oh, a I researcher see. myself, I understand. Uh, what research is about, and there is not uh, research, uh, research as it ought to be, but it's a driven research, and so I've taken a position against it. My comments would um, deal with the matters they have raised, but not reference to their data as their report. And, uh, and, and what is this position you've adopted? Uh, so, what, what is this position sorry? you've adopted? Do, do, are you suggesting that their research is skewed? 
I think that the research methodology is not rigorous. It is not uh, one that I have confidence in, and on the basis of that, I don't think that it's a valid research that I would engage and reference for purposes of validating their search. So on that basis, I decide not to uh, give it that uh, leverage uh, as a, a duly, uh, as a research that I recognize as having been done properly and consistent with uh, research practice. What though are your specific problems? Because I remember you have, you have said this to me in the past. Yes. And you yes. have, and, and this was a long time ago, uh, you right. have, you, Dr. Kabiru Mahama, who works at the vice president's office, had also said something uh, to that effect. So I'd like to pinpoint what exactly in the research methodology do you find problematic? Okay, so the, um, the very research, one of them that I have studied was one that was done sometime, I think, in August uh, 2022, thereabout. And the turnaround time for the uh, for sampling or for data collection was somewhere in uh, less than three days across the country. It was supposed to be a regional data that was collected. Now, I wonder if uh, the turnaround time and what was the sampling that started. It was how data who were um, and the mass system in that, uh, without question, uh, uh, is that they, the, the data which were just forged and uh, designed to paint the set picture they wanted to paint, and you can do that in this way. And that's the risk of community methodology team. Anyway, if you have to use the biomethodology risk will start. And so what that my big or make particular issue. And I think they haven't uh, driven uh, data, and this is what they want. They wanted to arrive at the place that in 2024, they will be the risk of And I don't want to uh, make that mistake because I believe, based on my understanding of this, that they are not being loyal to, uh, to the process. And so the data is not valid. But, uh, Richard, right, right before you go on, I'm not interjecting, but I noticed there are some patches in the sound. I don't know whether you could just reposition yourself because a lot of what you said over the last minute was a little low and patchy. So, so that as you continue, okay. we can hear you better. Um, okay. I think this it's is, better so now. This okay. I think it's better. Please go ahead. Okay. So, but the point I want to make uh, to begin with is that clearly Savi has been spoken and I think that uh, before he takes leave of us, uh, he should apologize for that. He made a comment that he wished that things get bad for the NPP. Uh, and, and I think you, you actually reiterated that point to see if we would retract or pull away from it, but he maintained that he actually wished. Uh, you see, the point the, I want to make on that is that you know, the NBC have made it their campaign to highlight the pain of Ghanaians, to just say that, oh, things are bad, things are bad, without offering any alternative ideas, and without even understanding the issue that led to the supposed pain that is talking about. So that's why then they would deny COVID-19 impact. That's why they would deny prosperity for impact economy. Uh, so on the basis of that, they are just seeking uh, appeal that they are looking at suffering and so therefore vote for us. And I don't think that that is a valid uh, conversation to be had because a democratic conversation should be about alternative ideas. So uh, if they, they want to engage in this campaign, they must present ideas and not want to leverage uh, the incidental active across the world, which Ghana is part of as a basis but, 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 but Richard, they, why, why, they, while I agree with you, while I agree with you to some extent, uh, they will tell you about the 24-hour economy and the rest and, and dealing with corruption. But, but the bit about spinning on the pain of the people against any particular administration, your, your administration is really good at that as well. Cast your mind back to 2012, 2016. I mean, you, you literally build your campaign on some of these. Yes, for you two, we can talk about free SHS and all of that. But that's what 
you do in the political space. Is that not, is that not the, the truth? Yeah, but bad. you've never heard anyone, at least not me, say that they pray that, that their campaign is predicated on things getting bad for their opponents. Which in essence, that they are praying that things get worse for Ghana, so they appear to be the alternative. Now, anybody who have real ideas and alternatives to offer will not make that kind of prayer. You understand? So for me, that is to a, to a very large extent um, a very poor statement to make and very unethical in terms of political discourse to say that oh, our own strength emanates from uh, things getting bad for Ghanaians. But on the basis of, of that, that's why I just say that Savi should uh, retract that because it doesn't sound good to be part of his record that he will be he's campaigning, wishing that they get back for Guardian so they can win. Uh, okay. the, the, the whole, I, I've heard about the report suggesting... Yeah, yeah so let, let, let me get into the report. Just give you some metrics to work with so that as you speak, okay. you can speak to the issues. The report, in summary, the executive summary points to the fact that 65% of voters, those sampled, believe Ghana is headed in the wrong direction. In fact, if you look at the age stratifications as well, uh, those 66 plus who feel the country is headed in the wrong direction, 70%. Those 56 to 65, 68%. Those 46 to 55, 64%. Those 36 to 45, 66%. And a crucial age uh, category, those 18 to 35, 65% say the country is headed in the wrong direction. Then 62% disapprove of President Ekufuado's performance. 52% of voters believe the government has performed not just poorly, very poorly. Your reactions? Yeah, thank you. And so, see, this goes to the heart of the matter. Um, to be able to take this uh, research um, and, and consider it serious research, you have to look at how the, the framing of the instrument, the questions in the, in the instruments, the individual measure. So if you take a measurement that is saying to say, is the country moving in the right direction? Uh, the framing of that question, the administration of that instrument to say, uh, if you came to my hometown in Aflau and you are administering that instrument, you are translating that question, is the country moving in the right direction? Anyway. For someone who cannot feed for themselves, okay, how do you translate that? And the consistency of the transition from uh, from Apau to uh, Paga to Kumasi somewhere or to Odia, somewhere around the country, how do you translate that tree and how is that in the world? Okay, so th these are things that I would, would give an indication to whether people are understanding the question or they are answering the question as designed to be measured. And so the point I make there is that the, the value that we place on the outcome of this uh, survey cannot be that conclusively people in this country have said that because the instrument itself can create problems for people's understanding and therefore the answers they are given whether or not they are answering the question about the country moving in the uh, right direction, which is relative. If you transfer, you translate that into one language and the other. And so for me, uh, the premium to be put on this is really not one that we should, uh, you know, take so high. But the, the, you can get a sense that yes, there is a political environment that is charged, that is constantly focused on. Uh, criticizing government wrongly sometimes uh, by the NDC and creating a sense, a heightened sense of, um, of, of difficulty in the country, dramatizing in many different ways to create that impression for people like things are exceedingly difficult. And so therefore, when you pose a question that somebody understands remotely to mean that you are asking whether things are difficult or whether uh, he's doing okay or whether things could have been better, you'll get these re uh, responses which may indicate that the country is going the wrong direction. So that, for me, would be the portion of any government, whether you are a Kufuado government or your NDC government or you are any other government, because you are in 
the arena. You are the government of the day, so people always visit their concerns, their worries, and their shortcomings are a matter of your uh, government. So right, in, in, right. Let, 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 not necessarily indicate anything other than people trying to say that well, government must do this, government must do this, and in our view, government is not doing all that we want right, to do. Right. So therefore, may not be anything other than that. Those are interesting submissions. I, I, I put this to Sami Jemfi and I'm putting it to you. I told Sami Jemfi that, listen, uh, this research points to something positive for the NDC. Uh, he was congratulating Musa Dankwa and I was saying that, listen, uh, if, it, if it did not favor you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be saying that. I, I, I would also put same to you on the other side that if this, you know, survey had favored you, I don't think you would be uh, punching some of the holes and saying what you're saying. But, but a crucial point, though it is not specifically in this survey, it is in the follow-up to this survey, right, which is yet to be mm. released. But based on the metrics that Musa Dankwa uh, and his team put together, with 18.3 million voters being considered, with a 70% voter turnout, and considering per past elections that about 2% of ballots get spoiled. They are saying, or he is saying, that in that categorization, per data he has now, the difference, the gap between the NDC's John Romani Mahama and the MPP's Dr. Mahmoud Baumia is 2.4 million votes, unprecedented in the Fourth Republic. What do you think? It appears unassailable. That's, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not I don't understand the modeling is using. The, what, what is the equation? How is it calculated? Musa Dankwa, you, let, let, let me let, let me let Musa Dankwa explain to you, maybe. Musa Dankwa, please. No, no, but, but, let, let, me, let me finish speaking. But the point is that whatever model is going to say that this is how we arrive at that and this, what is the precedent? What's the, what is the analysis over time? What is the parameter on the basis of which he is making when, that when, when in 2016, speech. the that, MPP won right. by, by some 800,000 plus votes. Did you see that coming? So... It was so, unprecedented. So that reality, oh, Benjamin, hold on. Reality is different from modeling to arrive at a conclusion. If you are modeling something, then you are, looking, you are modeling based on, you know, evidence that this has happened, that has happened, that has happened. So you build a model to lead to a certain outcome, given that history, right? But what he is saying, I'm just saying that there is no precedent that has been demonstrated that on the basis of this, we are building a model to give us a possible future outcome based on this happening. That trend I haven't seen. So for me, it is him, again, doing the convenience trying to insert themselves in the middle of a political conversation, which has been their MO from day one. They come up with this research so that we talk about them, and so therefore they become the matter, uh, the, the center of conversation in terms of predicting the outcome of the 2024 election for a certain uh, specific political agenda. So for me, uh, that is him talking. It is not reflective of the reality that we'll experience in 2024, uh, December 7th. And so this should be taken with a pinch of salt um, and not anything that uh, uh, should be uh, taken as a conclusive prediction for the outcome of the 2024 December 7th election. Gentlemen, hold for me. Please don't go. Sammy Jemfi, hold for me. Richard Ayangba, hold for me. Let me bring in Dr. Michael Ayangba uh, as well. You've listened to quite a lot. What do you make? Now, uh, I just want to take your thoughts before I come back into the studio and let Musa Dankwa also have his, uh, his say. The direction of the country, like I pointed out, if you look at the age stratification, 18 to 35, crucial group, 65% say the country is headed in the wrong direction. Uh, 36 to 45, 66% say that. 46 to 55 range, 64% say that. The 56 to 65 range, 68% say that. And as for the 66 plus year olds, 70%. What do you think this could signal ahead of election 2024? Yeah, you remember my discussion with you the other time. I said, I am almost certain that we'll be starting with the President of the Raman, from uh, January uh, 7, 2025. Uh, 
the league is all assailable. And I might just uh, make this quick but uh, that based on the explanation of uh, uh, Musa Dankwa, I think that uh, I'm quite satisfied with the treatment of Asawasi now, that the 30% also was carried down to uh, the voter inclusion there. So I'm very uh, satisfied now. And I think that uh, we need to commend them as we rightly uh, uh, did. You don't rubbish a poll, uh, polling uh, agency or a polling uh, uh, organization based on one poll. There are times they get it right, times they get it wrong. So I'm quite worried that uh, someone has taken a position based on a particular poll that they uh, favor them. It doesn't encourage researchers and uh, people who are dealing with these sciences to go on. So uh, on that score, I would uh, 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 now uh, thank Musa uh, Dankwa and Info Analytics for at least attempting to make this thing our culture. Uh, looking at the numbers, one important thing we need to take into account is the fact that a moving average tells you uh, how reality is reflecting on an average. And if you take that into consideration, and I want to particularly uh, stress that, that you look at between October 2023 and April 2024, the MPP has lost 6% of its votes. And it has been a consistent trend. In fact, there's a trend, a better trend in the, uh, the illusion of uh, uh, voters than we are seeing in the declining inflation or in the growth of our, our economy. So if you take these things into consideration, uh, you don't have to uh, scratch your head too much to realize that the country is headed in the wrong direction. People are not happy and they are saying it. If I were somebody, I'll probably take this document and work with it because it is close to reality. I already told you that I think that these numbers are uh, well uh, Padded. I would say padded per se, but they reflect a better position for uh, the MPP than reality actually. And so so uh, you mean you, you mean the poll? The poll even puts yeah. the MPP in a good stead, better than what it the reality on the better, ground is. I see that it's better. It's relatively. Look, there's one uh, a group of uh, families, friends of us in the Ashanti region. These guys will tell you they will never vote uh, against the MPP, no matter what happens. The last time we met them, they said every member of their family have decided to vote against the uh, MPP. And as the survey rightly put, it's a mixture of factors. The way in which uh, uh, Honorable uh, Alan Chimantou was handled in the party, plus their management of the economy, this combined to affect the MPP badly. Because this is someone who is a stalwart of the party, who has bided his time. And he feels that when it came for uh, the time for him to actually uh, project himself, he felt it was his time now. The status quo ensured that the, left, the playing field was not fair, according to him, and uh, he eventually left the party. I think that he is taking along with him a significant chunk of the MPP members and then leaving a group of them that are disenchanted, that don't feel energized about the MPP and the ruling government then you take the economic hardship into consideration. And when you are away from the people, you don't uh, uh, feel it. As I sit now, if I if take my camera out, now, there will be somebody probably in front of my house waiting for something. And these are strong people, energetic people. You can't tell somebody, go and work, you are lazy. No, there is no work to do. First, when you were strong and you were begging, you say, go and work. There is nothing to do. That is how the country uh, has gone. Uh, you, I also listened to the communication director of the MPP saying that uh, uh, it is an incident or an accident uh, uh, in the global arena, and they are not totally to blame. Let me be honest with you. Every MPP member must start every statement they are making with an apology to the people of this country. Because I told you, the name of the crisis we are facing is called excessive borrowing and mismanagement of credit receipts. That is what has led us here. Everything we are doing today has to do with debt treatment, debt crisis, debt distress, and that has been done by the MPP and nobody else. We are talking about you adding about 50 billion to our dollars to our debt stock. 
and taking us to debt treatment and still adding to the debt stock even under debt treatment. And you see, the nature of the debt restructuring is not something that actually gives us a permanent reprieve. It is just postponing our woes. And when we are finally done with this thing, and it is time for us to re repay, the interest at the station now is only uh, 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 payments we have suspended. The interest is accruing on our debt. So anybody who understands the numbers, look at all these things and will say that no, everything we are doing, yes, there is COVID, yes, there was Ukraine crisis, but we have made a situation worse by our uh, unbridled and uh, 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 sometimes immoral appetite for uh, borrowing, the misuse of these credit receipts, and non-investment in the important sectors of the economy, failure to create sustainable jobs, and creating opportunities and uh, systems that allow for the siphoning of state resources away from production and away from uh, employment. You have created the most discouraging and depressing business environment I've ever seen in this country. That corporate taxes are at their highest. So you can look at all these things and think that any poll they make should favor you. And if the poll doesn't favor you, the poll star is not uh, clean. I don't think that is uh, uh, right. All right. I know what let's, so let, let's get to some specifics now. And I want to do a juxtaposition here. When you look at the performance of government and different metrics are looked at, you would see that per this poll, those that feel government has performed averagely, 13%, very good or good, um, 29%. Excellent is 6%. But poor or very poor, massed together, 52% feel the country is not heading in the right direction in that regard. Then you look at the standard of living. In January 2024, 20%. In April 2024, 19%. That's the categorization. Uh, those who feel it has improved. Those who feel it has worsened. In January, 54%. In April, 51%. Those unchanged. 22% in January, 24% in April, and then no opinion, 4% in January, 6% in April. But you put that side by side with this latest uh, survey, and I don't know whether Richard Ahiang, but will uh, say that that survey is credible. I'll, I'll, I'll want to find out. But it says Ghana is the fifth best governed country. That, I'm, I'm just putting the two together. Governance here, what it says per this survey, and then the ranking uh, by this UK-based uh, World Economics, which says that Ghana is fifth in Africa and first in West Africa. I find it interesting because they are looking at metrics such as democracy, governance, corruption, among others. How do you put these two side by side? Yes, uh, it is uh, interesting. I, I won't dismiss the study as I've told you. Uh, it takes research a great deal of effort Yes, there are others that set out with a, a predetermined uh, objective to get some results out. But you cannot have a full state. There will be one or two uh, challenges, but most of the time, we move around them. Uh, if you look at the uh, governance and you are uh, talking about democracy, uh, democracy is something Ghana decided to do. Everybody decided to uh, engage in it. So even despite our hardship, uh, the suffering, You've seen that uh, our security services have remained in the barracks. They allow the Ghanaians to select their leaders uh, through the ballot. I don't see how uh, government can take uh, credit for that. It's something for the people of Ghana. If for anything at all, uh, this government has made moves to suppress uh, freedom of speech, have closed down radio stations. We have the rampant uh, picking of people who have uh, uh, said some bad things about uh, government. It is on record to uh, probably have harassed journalists more than any other government. So uh, I don't see uh, anything uh, good about the government. If you just take a poll and say Ghana is a democracy, therefore it's worse, a uh, better government, there must be some relativity. Relative to what? If you compare it to the environments and the democracy we had maybe three, four, five, six, or even seven years ago, then you are talking. But uh, usually, to measure a government against its own previous uh, worst performance, I don't think we are uh, uh, making progress uh, here. To say right. Ghana, Ghana is the uh, one of the best governed uh, countries here, 
yes, we are a democracy, fine. We pretend to uh, uh, depend on institutions, that is okay. But these institutions have been uh, weakened and compromised in the last five, six years. And uh, there's no uh, uh, doubt about that. You are just beginning to read things that are coming out from the uh, scholarship secretariat and the rest. All these things, right? Uh, you have them, and uh, people look at this bread and butter issue. This government has not been able to uh, reduce poverty, has not uh, been able to uh, create employment, has not made any significant capital investments to ensure that we are competitive uh, in the global trend of things. Right. Our education system is lagging far behind. So mm -hmm. these are the things people consider. And when you just think, uh, you do a desk uh, uh, research and say, okay, Ghana's democracy is holding steady. They are still selecting their leaders by the ballot. Elections is not uh, democracy or elections is not governance. Okay. And that is All where... Right. One more uh, thing, I think where the FP ought to be worried, more worried, is this uh, free SHS uh, generation. If you see the trend they are going, despite everything that has been done, they feel that the country is not going the right direction. This is a system where we all almost have some form of a state orchestration of examination and practices, and I mean it when I say it. And yet, the active beneficiaries of that act think that government is not taking this country in the so right, that's, right that's, direction. So that's a huge problem, right. Um, yeah, it's a big problem. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ayamga. I'm going to do this, gentlemen. I'll give you just a little bit of time to wrap up, but because you've not reacted, Richard Ahiagba has accused your outfit of bias. Are you biased? And he says the type of questions at administration. In fact, he has no faith in, in your statistics. What's your quick reaction? Then I'll give each of you gentlemen a minute and then, just to be fair, and then we are gone. You know, we are the only posters that publish our questionnaire well ahead of time for all to see what question we are going to ask. So if you had a question, you should be that question. You have at least called us. He mm. has not done so. He also says that our poll that we spent three days together was his problem. We have over 150 people in the field, in the country. It shouldn't, we don't take paper and pen to the field. We use tablets, real-time data. When we normally take about 10 days to finish our poll of 5,000. So the three-day thing was, well, not was, 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 was not true. Was not true, not true. And then again, you see, credible companies like Fitch, who are endowed top researchers. Fitch Solutions. Solutions. I use our data. So if I decide not to use it, we're not bothered at all. Hey, are you firing shots? <laughs> anyway, Fitch Solutions uses your data. So if uh, Richard Ahagba decides not to use it's not a problem. It's not your problem. No. All right, final words. Very final words, 30 seconds, and I'll give the others. We one. are very independent. We don't do our work because somebody wants us to do it this way. We are doing it because we are a company and we believe that's what we do. That's our business. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll look forward to Monday sure. and the latest one as well. Sami Jemfi, if you're with us uh, in, in a minute or less, final thoughts. Thank you some of the things Richard said. But first of all, let me say that uh, if there is anybody who has to issue an apology and a re retraction of comments they have made uh, in the course of the discussion, it is Richard, Richard and no one else. He just came on to rant and bastardize a reputable, you know, institution like Global Info Analytics without any well-reasoned basis, without any intellectual basis. Richard must understand that you don't do that. If you want to criticize... But, but is it not a bit unfair? Code, is it not a bit unfair to criticize his intellectual, you know, I mean... You are basically denigrating his intellectual that, capacity. I mean, we are told that the MPP is a party of intellectuals, right? And so they should behave like intellectuals. If you want to find fault with, you know, uh, uh, um, an opinion poll which has been published, it should be based on something. Are you faulting the methodology? Do you have a problem with the sample size? Do you have a problem with the sampling allocation or the weighting of the various sample allocations and so on? So far, he has not raised any cogent flaw about the poll which has been published by Global Info Analytics. He's just ranting and insulting the organization, and that is not fair. Richard can do better than that. Again, I never said that I wish things get worse for the people of Ghana. What I said, and you can bear you know, witness to that, 
is that I wish the electoral fortunes of the MPP continue to worsen and deteriorate. Is that not what I said? That's what I said. And I said, it, it, deservingly so. Because, you see, you reap what you sow. You cannot destroy an economy. You cannot impoverish the people of your country. Right. You cannot mismanage your economy and plunge your country into bankruptcy. Right. And expect respondents in, in a poll to, 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 to what? Say that they have confidence in you. Or right. approve of your governance, your or say that the your economy is headed up. in the right direction, right. when the economy is headed in the wrong direction. So right. look, they are reaping what they have sown. Lastly, lastly. Very I briefly, Sammy, I, I don't have much time. Very briefly, Richard, I beg you. I have always told Richard to follow the campaign of John Mahama and to update himself of the, the many policies, as I speak today, the over 70 policy alternatives that we have announced. Okay. If he does that, Right. He will spare himself the kind of embarrassment. He always, you know... Right, right. I get it. On like that because mm. we have outlined several... So I get it. You have, you have, you have policy alternatives. I, I get it. Sammy Genfi, thank you. A list, we can share it with him for his own education. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Sammy Genfi. Richard Hayagba. All right. Uh, Benjamin, obviously, uh, it's going to be one, more than one minute. Uh, what was the name of the, the NDC communicator who spoke after me? Communicator? The NDC communicator who spoke immediately after me. What, uh, you mentioned him, I didn't catch it. Uh, not, not Musa Dankwa. It's not an NDC communicator. It's uh, Dr. Michael Ayamga. He's an economist. Ah. He's, he's actually, he's oh, yeah. actually he's... I think I sense something in what you're saying. But let me just let you know that he's actually no. someone who was a member of the MPP and campaigned okay. actively for the MPP. All right. All right. Well, he talks like an NDC person. Because when you put to before him the data from the World Economics uh, return vis-a-vis -vis this, he, he still was speaking the way he was speaking, validating that this research is a confirmation, um, global infantilism, a confirmation of certain things that he believed needed. But you see, I, I want he said something. And I, I won't uh, address my defense. As for me, I won't call that on him because that is uh, his brand time. You see, if you look at some uh, report that uh, Roy did this year, February 1, the headline is Global Safety New Record by 300 in Okay? Uh, I'll just hear at the same report. General state of this talking about global debt record that is this day created by the January 3 7 trillion. And they want to say that is equal to 4,000 per person global. Every individual on the face of the earth owes $40,000. So it cannot be true. And it's not what the doctor. Ayamga, uh, if I get a name right, has said that this government and the situation Ghana is in is a result of government debt. Okay, government's reckless borrowing. It is not true. That's the NDC narrative. That's why I say he's an NDC communicator. What we are experiencing is unprecedented global debt that has hit a certain level on the back of the global effect. Okay, from COVID-19 and the, the, the incident okay. of... Okay, uh, I, 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 I have something so else to, to ask. For me, just, just let me just talk to one quick second. Mm. That is for me the fact. And I think right. that Benjamin, you do a very, uh, uh, very fair analysis often, so you should be able to educate all of us. Take the numbers and put them together to say that if global debt is reaching that level, how is it that Ghana is the outlier or the anomaly? We cannot have a reasonable conversation talking like the way uh, Dr. Ayamga was speaking. It is clearly the NDC narrative is forwarding. Everything submits us as a, as a, as a matter of intellectual conversation. I mean, I've never known him to have international, intellectual analysis, so that one is not a matter. But the point I am making is that we are in a situation that is global, not local. And that must be taken into account. And so it cannot be right that the, the current situation in our country 
is the direct, absolute doing of the government. It's an impact we inherited from the global community. And that is the problem. And if Ghana says the country is moving in the wrong direction, given this poll, the entire world is moving in the, in the wrong direction. And that is what we must emphasize. And then in our own context, see how government is plotting our way. Because, Benjamin, now, you see the economy is turning around. That is, should be the conversation. And that is the conversation consistent with global evolution. Our economy has turned around. The, the macroeconomic indicators are looking very good. And we're hoping that we'll continue on this trajectory. And I believe, I believe that by, by the returns of this first quarter, we'll demonstrate that the economy is continuing to move in the right direction. Right. Richard. So as for the NDC, this mm. negative communication that they have taken and hoping that things get worse for Daniels, which exactly is what Ami said. Not well, he said that's not people. that's not what he's suggesting. That you've dug a hole, and and if well, it gets worse for no, you in terms of said. electoral that's outcomes, that is it. That's but, what he but, said. But Richard, and that was the reason why Richard, he reiterated for him to correct himself, but he didn't. That's Richard, what he said. Richard, Richard, Richard. I just want you to do this before you go. That's why I'm interjecting. Right. What what, okay. what does the MPP from where you sit? Mm. What do you make of? that newly announced alliance between Alad Tremating, his, his movement for change, and Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. That could be a potent third force and affect, erode the electoral outcomes of the MPP, maybe the NDC as well. But quickly, what do you make of it? Well, uh, Benjamin, the, the thing about it is that uh, they, uh, they, are for, they are forging their own electoral strategy. And for us, we are focused on forging our strategy. And I believe that when all is said and done, uh, the December 7th election will belong to Dr. Mahmoud Baobia and the MPP. That's what our preoccupation is, and we are working hard to ensure that that is a reality. On all case. right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Richard Ayangba, for joining the conversation. Let me uh, come to Dr. Ayangba. Dr. Ayangba, if, if you could do some 30 seconds, I'd be very grateful. 30 seconds. We have to go. Uh, ben, that is not fair to me. Uh, unfortunately, time, time is not. We've all had a fair share of... Ample time to talk. Let me say okay, you go ahead. We're talking about a government that has borrowed 50 billion in seven years, about five, six billion per year. It's NDC uh, communication. I'm happy to project myself as one. If talking about the corruption that is taking place under this government, and I'm not the one that just connect the sharing of corruption that is meant for needy people, it's the NDC communicator. I'm happy to project myself as one. If talking about the suffering, the daily struggles of the people, people not being able to put food on the table because of the economic policies of this government makes me an NDC communicator, I am happy to present myself as one. Uh, let me tell him uh, that I don't have the time to uh, respond to him. Going, being an NDC member, if talking about correcting things in this country is being an NDC communicator, it is like going for a pilgrimage because the status quo is dirty and it's like committing a sin. That's my word. Thank you, gentlemen, for having joined the conversation. It's been fantastic. Uh, Musa Dankwa in the studio, uh, Global Info Analytics. Thank you so much. We also had uh, Dr. Michael Ayamga, a development economist, econ economist with the UDS, Sami Jemfi, National Commission Officer, uh, National Communications Officer, NDC, and then uh, Richard Einhag, by Director of Communications with the MPP. Of course, Musa Dankwa is the Executive Director. I'm just trying to get the titles right. Executive Director, Global Info Analytics. Now, stay with us. We have a lot more. Who's going to be the next big model? Do you know? It could be you. We're going to be talking up next about Africa's model scout. Details after the break. This is the final belt of the AM show, and we're going to talk about modeling. I don't know if you've heard, Africa's model scout has been a long time coming, but now it's finally here, up for grabs, for one rough diamond is a chance to be propelled onto the coolest catwalks and a la mode magazines 
This is a journey of discovery for the continent's most promising future model. I'm joined via Zoom by the executive producer and host of Africa's Model Scouts, Stella Labi. Good morning, Stella. It's a pleasure to have you join us for the conversation on The AM Show. Good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. I must say it's commendable. I understand you're native Ghanaian. So coming back to do this Africa Model Scout here in Ghana, it's, it's admirable. How Thank do you, you find the process? Thank you. Proud, proud native Ghanaian. <laughs> okay. But what really inspired you to do this, Africa Model Scouts? What inspired you to come back and give young girls the opportunity to partake in a grand um, exposure like this? Um, I believe that we have a lot of amazing talent and the fact that I don't see us represented as much mainstream, um, that is what really gave me the punch. It's, it's, it's a big industry, you know, the, the, the fashion industry is even last year, 2023, um, it generated about 58 billion pounds in England. In South Africa, it generated about $6 billion. And in Ghana, we generated $3.1 billion from the mm. fashion industry. So it's a big industry. Yeah. That's, that's a big one. And yes. coming back here to film in Ghana, did you encounter any challenges? And I mean, looking at the figures you're just putting out, it means that there's a place for Ghana to compete with the rest of the world. What challenges did you encounter and what resources do you think Ghanaians should be looking to, um, to get or acquire in order for us to also compete with the rest of the world? Huh, that's a good one. Well, there were some challenges, um, you know, coming there and starting something new, especially with models. Um, there is a bit of a stigma, I think, still in Ghana about what a model is. Mm. Um, and I, and, I, and I think we need to maybe educate everybody a little bit more about, you know, what a model does, the importance of a model in this fashion industry, because they are the ones who actually help to sell these products that are making so much money. So it's, it's not just a, you know, you look pretty and you kind of stand around kind of job. I think that's very, very important that we bring that a little across. Um, I think a lot of our talented girls are worried or don't, maybe don't have the support maybe mm. that they need to come forward and say, I want to do this because of the stigma, again, that comes along with being a model in Ghana and what the definition right now of that is um and so that's one of the challenges that mm. that i had during during season one of the show okay um yes and then of course there's you know that there are some challenges also with the ladies um not being aware or not not really seeing all the work that goes into and the time that goes into doing this um and i think we need resources. When I say resources, I think we need to promote our, our talents a little bit more and, and just trust that they're good and we bring them on the mainstream. Okay. So before you even tell us about your, what we should look forward to in season two, I know this season one has already been aired and all that. Are you happy with your winner? <laughs> I am so proud. Okay. I'm so, so proud of the winner. Yes, she's worked very hard and, and I stand behind her. I, I think we have a great winner. I do. Fantastic. So what shall we expect in the coming season? Well, um, season two is definitely going to be um, the casting part of it is going to be much more intense. Mm. Um, we're definitely we're going to cast in more places and more days to give people more opportunity to be able to show up and and you know and shoot their shot and, mm. and cast. Um, so that that's one thing that will be different. We'll do it in different locations. Um, I think season two will be a little bit more challenging as far as 
the the challenges and things are concerned because I think now everybody understands now what this show is about. Mm. Um, we're going. I'm going to be much harder. That means um, if you don't show up, you're completely out. So you know. So season two only come for the casting if you're willing to put in the work. Um, yeah, those are a few. Did I answer your question? Yeah, it does. It answers <laughs> my question. It does. My final question: did, did you get your money's worth? Would you say this was a good investment? It's still to see. I believe it was. I believe it was, and I believe it's it's a process. You know, this mm. things are not going to happen overnight. Um, but with the first winner going out and and doing stuff and coming back and opening more doors, um, I think there'll be a change. Yes. Okay. In about thirty seconds, there are young women watching you who are aspiring models. If you come to Ghana again for season two. What would be the A game you'd be expecting them to bring? Well, um, first you have to want this. It's, it's work. Um, you have to be willing to stay and finish the season. Um, so you have to, you know, there is a whole period where you're away from your family and your loved ones and, you know, that, that. Bring your confidence. Believe that you can do it. Um, let me be the judge if it's going to work or not. But you believe in yourself. So if you yeah. think you got what it takes, you want the opportunity to explore that. If you want the opportunity to travel, leave here, and, 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 and really are passionate about modeling, come. Um, I need you to be a certain height. <laughs> that, okay. that we need you to do. And enthusiasm and be willing to learn. Right. There you have it. Thank you so much, Abigail Stella Labi, who's the executive producer and host of Africa's Model Scouts. I wish you all the best in the next season. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. Right. So there you have it. All too soon, we've come to the end of the AM show for today. Friday. I like Fridays. <laughs> um, we are back on your screens on Monday, Benjamin and I, from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. But you can still continue the conversations on social media. Let us know your thoughts on everything we've discussed here today, from my conversation with the chairman of the National Peace Council, that analysis on the data from Global Info Analytics and all that, and now Model Scout Africa. Thank you for watching, and it's a wrap. Bye.